Okay. Well, uh, welcome to the White House Forum on Campus and Community Scale Climate Solutions. Um, I'm so excited to see all of you. I, I know quite a few of you, and for those who, of us who haven't met, uh, I'm looking forward to the next day and a half with you. Um, so today we have participants from colleges and universities all across the country. So that's 48 states and the District of Columbia. We have community colleges, we have public and land grant universities, we have private universities, we have HBCUs, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian, and Asian American Pacific Islander serving institutions. So welcome to all of you. And also welcome to the participants who are joining us on the live stream today. So before we jump into what I think is going to be a very exciting conversation about what campuses are and can do to accelerate climate solutions, I want to say a little bit more about why we're here. So communities across the country, from small rural communities to large metropolitan areas, are now being presented with opportunities, challenges, and questions they've never had to address before. New opportunities to adopt low-cost electricity generation like solar and wind, or add battery storage to the local grids to make it more resilient. And new job opportunities created by battery factories, electric vehicle manufacturing, and carbon management facilities that are springing up across the country. And new opportunities provided by historic legislation created by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act that reduce energy bills and make infrastructure more resilient to a changing climate. But along with all these opportunities also come challenges. Challenges caused by increasingly common extreme weather events like the polar vortex that shut down large parts of the electric grid in Texas for days. Challenges from wildfires in the West that rage for, from weeks to seasons, causing enormous disruption to thousands of communities and millions of people. Challenges caused by flooding from extreme rainfall events, hurricanes with increasing intensity, and rising sea levels. And challenges from historic inequities in how the benefits and burdens of energy use and production are distributed. In response to these events, many communities are now asking, what's the best option for my community for commun cleaner energy and increasing resilience in the face of change? And how much will it cost and how do we pay for it? And how do we weigh the cost and benefits of different choices? And how can we address environmental justice concerns in making sure, including making sure that everyone benefits from our infrastructure investments? And how can we provide training and educational opportunities to prepare our communities for the new clean energy jobs of the future? The answers to these questions are going to vary all across the country. Every region has different opportunities and challenges. Every region has different natural and infrastructure resources to draw on. And every region has different preferences. So here's where colleges and university campuses come in. Because you too are asking all of these same questions of yourself. And in fact, college campuses in many ways are similar to small towns and cities across the country. With on-campus populations ranging, ranging from thousands to tens of thousands, campuses have their own residential facilities, operate a large collection of commercial buildings, provide heat, electricity, and water, and typically operate a fleet of vehicles to provide transportation services. So in other words, from an infrastructure perspective, campuses look an awful lot like small cities because they're presented with the same opportunities and challenges. And campuses have tremendous intellectual resources to understand and exp explain these opportunities to their students and to their surrounding communities. They have the resources to help make, them go help make good choices. And they have innovative solutions developed on their own campuses to deploy. And resources to train the next generation students so they're prepared to thrive as we scale up climate solutions across the country. 
and you are located from all across, across the country, as we heard, and you he have deep and long-time ties to the communities in which you're embedded. Simply put, you have so much to offer. So about a year ago, a conversation started among a number of universities, uh, and, and you're in the room, and thank you for that, with the goal to explore the question is what more could they do to the leverage the unique role they play as educators, researchers, and community members. So today's forum is a result of that conversation and the dozens that followed and is just the beginning of an inclusive effort to marshal the strengths of campuses to help one of the defining issues of our time, especially in including the nearly 20 million students enrolled in our post-secondary education system across the country. I am deeply grateful to the National Sciences Foundation who made today's forum possible and our collaborators at the University of Washington and as well as many of you in our growing network of campuses across the country. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'll now hand off to my colleague, Alexandra Isern, Assistant Director for Geosciences at the National Science Foundation. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Sally. It's, it's um, really an honor to be here, um, and I'm very happy that I was allowed to give some introductory remarks. Um, and also, my colleagues are also here from the National Science Foundation, and we are very happy that we were able to support this important activity. Um, the goal of this workshop, as Sally just mentioned, um, to lever leverage our higher education system to help address the critical issue of climate resilience and climate and community scale solutions is really an innovative approach. And, and that's why when we saw the opportunity to invest in this, we were very happy to do so. Um, I'm very confident that this activity is going to really provide a dynamic environment to discuss the critical pathways that we need to take towards developing community scale solutions and to leverage the strong connections that our campuses have with our communities. Uh, kind of as an aside, I live in Bozeman, Montana most of the time and Montana State is a really essential part of our local community. They contribute in, in many, many ways, but one important way is that they really are a source of significant community outreach to help the community understand how the delicate balance of our regional environment is being disrupted at rates that are really unprecedented in Earth's history. The faculty and staff at the university also make um, significant contributions to the regional understanding of how our community can be more resilient it, particularly in the increasingly common compounding natural hazards that we're seeing in the news every day. So despite the successes that we're already seeing with Montana State, using my example, in the community, there's so much more that can be done. And again, thinking of Montana, the networking of all the institutions of varying sizes in this regional broad community has so much more power than just institutions acting alone. So. Um, I just lay that out there as a source, as maybe a point for discussion as we talk during the meeting. So what, what, how can NSF help? Um, from NSF's perspective, again, this is a really critical opportunity for us, and it's why we made the investment to support the activity. And if I can make an ask of this group, um, over the next day, today and tomorrow, um, please keep in mind how the National Science Foundation can help uh, advance the ideas and goals that come out of the meeting, whether it's a specific ask of NSF itself or whether there's something that NSF can do in partnership with the other agencies that we work with all the time to really try and, and make things happen. Um, I thought it might be useful just to tell you a little bit about um, our thinking within National Science Foundation, in particular the Geoscience Directorate that houses Earth, Atmosphere, Ocean, and polar research. Um, we've been working a lot with our staff within the Geoscience Directorate, across the National Science Foundation, and with our partner agencies uh, to really think about uh, how to best invest in uh, addressing the climate imperative. At NSF specifically, we are really focusing on efforts that operate at regional and local scales. That's why for us this meeting is so important. 
We're really focusing on use-inspired, outcome-driven research. We know that we're facing a climate imperative and we need to see results. Um, in particular, we're looking at investments that are really tied in the innovation space. We just established our first new directorate at National Science Foundation in over 30 years, and one of my colleagues here is from that directorate, uh, Technology Innovation and Partnerships, because our goal is really to look at the market-driven um, forces on advancing the research environment. And so one of our things that we really are, are working on is how can, in the climate space, we invest in innovation. But critical to everything we're doing in climate is from the start, we have to integrate workforce development, we have to in integrate diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in all of our research. And so again, these are things that the institutions are thinking about, and so it's another reason that we're glad we're here. Um, it's clear that campus and community in interactions are an ideal incubator for all the climate solutions we've been discussing. Um, Campus and community inter interactions provide a very innovative um, and creative environment where sustainable solutions can be developed, but importantly, educating the next generation workforce. I'm gonna say the point again. I've got it three times on my talking points. <laughs> educating the future research, re the future workforce is critical if we want to have a resilient earth, not just for us, but for everyone else on the planet. We're at a time, and, and Maya can probably tell us more, where the academic institutions are seeing dramatic declines in student enrollments in those disciplines that are critical to understand our Earth system. We need to figure out how to stop this drain. Um, so we really need your help in making that happen, and uh, as part of the discussion here, this is a space we'd really like to help in. Uh, so from NSF, again, I wanna thank you in advance for all of you for your time, not only waiting in line to get in the building, but also for being here and for those online for participating. Um, the time you're spending in these discussions over the next two days are so critical to advancing, again, towards a more resilient future. Uh, this is really gonna be an exciting space and I'm so excited I get to be here, really to, um, to hear your discussions, to hear how you catalyze your um, ideas ac across your campuses and catalyze ideas mm -hmm. in how to move forward. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for that really wonderful presentation. I'm Mary Frances Repko. I'm the Deputy National Climate Advisor to the President, and I work here at the White House in the Climate Policy Office. I don't think I need to overstate this for any of you, but this is the decisive decade to tackle the climate crisis. We need to act on the scale that this crisis demands, and that means all hands on deck, everywhere, right now, to set a global example. And that's exactly what this administration is doing. The Biden administration has passed the largest investment in clean energy and climate action in history. The bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, which I'm pleased to be at the White House to help implement, have set the stage for a transformational decade. A clean energy transition that creates resilient, climate smart communities will improve people's lives from the bottom up and from the middle out. And it will do so by creating good paying jobs, increasing American competitiveness, delivering clean air and clean water, increasing access in a, um, to affordable energy, and building community resistance, resilience. In order to achieve these objectives, this demands the implementation of mitigation, adaptation, and resilience solutions through deep community partnerships. Like I said earlier, it's really time for all hands on deck. The reason I'm here is that colleges and universities, as Sally mentioned, are uniquely positioned as key partners that can both raise awareness about the climate challenges that we face educate and compel young people to act to tackle the climate crisis, and train and retrain our workforce to make sure that these infrastructure and climate projects are a reality. Climate change doesn't know geographic boundaries. 
like the edge of the campuses that you've all come here um, from. Higher education institutions, as was previously mentioned, are communities within a larger community, and together, all of you can help catalyze climate solutions that work for everyone. Many of your institutions have climate actions or resilience planning underway, and I'm proud to let you know that the federal government is here to help you scale and to implement those efforts. You have a critical role to play in the clean energy transition, not just through the critical research and knowledge cultivation that you do, but also in the examples that you set with your everyday campus operations to bring benefits to your local community. And here I'm thinking about things like green infrastructure, energy efficiency upgrades, solar panels, campus waste reduction initiatives, bike share programs, resilience planning, and more. Leaderships by colleges and universities to decarbonize and to make their own campus ecosystems resilient is, resilient is critical. Such action can help build lo the local workforce for the clean energy economy, stimulate the economy from the ground up, make climate actions more tangible in your communities, and, and inspire more communities to make net zero commitments. If you'll indulge me, uh, I always like to talk to campuses by talking about the universities that I'm closest to. As an alum of the Johns Hopkins University, I know that their leadership as a global research university is strengthened by their commitments to campus sustainability. In 2019, they announced an agreement that put them on track to meet two-thirds of their electricity needs with solar power, exceeding their goal by cutting carbon emissions in half by 2025. They're also working to update their sustainability and climate action plan with increased ambition. My graduate school alma mater, which I'm proud, I believe, to be joined in this room and online today, the University of Michigan, has taken the, if you can't tell from my Midwestern accent, which probably comes through clearly as I'm speaking, um, has taken the lead in putting people at the center of our energy future. And the university has formed uh, uh, the way for carbon capture utilization and storage technologies with its global CO2 initiative. Operationally, the university has achieved their goal of cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 25% and are well on their way to eliminating 100% of the scope one and two emissions that they've identified by 2040. And in keeping on the Michigan theme, it's Michigan State University that kept the lights on at my house. My parents both taught there, my brother is currently on the MSU staff, and the university is working to cut emissions in half by 2030 from a 2010 baseline. They expect to achieve full carbon neutrality by 2050. MSU has been encouraging their students to think systemically act on climate challenges and inspire others to take action and build, on, build climate smart communities. This framework comes to life by weaving the sustainability into all aspects of the MSU campus, curriculum, community, and its culture. There's more to do together, and so that's why today I'm excited to share with you another entry point into that work. The White House's new electric vehicle acceleration challenge can help accelerate our clean energy future. This challenge issues a call to action to all our stakeholders to actively support our nation's historic transition to electric vehicles. If your institution has plans to invest in EV acquisition, infrastructure, education of the workforce of the future, training or tools, we invite you to share those commitments with us, both new initiatives and expansion of longstanding ones. This could mean developing tools or resources for your communities, purchasing more EVs, expanding the university's charging infrastructure. You can find out more about this challenge at cleanenergy.gov, and I hope you'll share your commitments so that we can learn from them here at the White House and we can build on each other's leadership. In being here with you today, I'm reminded of how formative the college experience is. I literally grew up in a university community. Many people would describe East Lansing as a town of 35,000 people that becomes a town of 90,000 people when the students are, are present. It's a time when young people begin to discover themselves and the causes that they care about. It was formative for me in shaping the values that I hold and the, and the, the, lives that, the life that I now lead and the lives that you all hope to lead. 
In your higher education work, you have the opportunity to lead by example, and that means setting new goals and responding to climate challenges in visible ways. And those ways can help shape your, shape your students and our future leaders to see the role of climate action in their lives, regardless of the career paths that they pursue. Thank you so much for your leadership and work on this issue. Thank you for accepting the challenge of addressing climate change. And on behalf of the Biden-Harris administration, I look forward to working alongside you and your communities to realize a clean and resilient future for everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Rialfi and I'm an energy policy assistant at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, we've had three wonderful speakers uh, set the stage for the sessions today and now we're gonna shift to a series of three panels. Um, the first panel is we're gonna hear from four federal government agencies um, on the work they do across colleges and universities. Um, and I'll invite them up to the front table now. The first panel will be moderated by my colleague, Dr. Costa Samaras, Principal Assistant Director for Energy and Chief Advisor for Energy Policy here at OSTP. Thank you so much, Rachel. As we've heard, there are large opportunities for higher education institutions to be the catalyst in, and the leaders in demonstrating how net zero and climate smart communities can improve people's lives and build a future for everyone. For this first panel, we're gonna explore the opportunities for government and higher education partnerships to be that accelerant uh, and to deliver regional climate solutions. And we have just the right panel to help us think through this very important topic. We have Caitlin Simpson, Program Manager at the CAP-RISA program at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We have Julian Reyes, National Coordinator for the Climate Hubs Program at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We have David Nemso at the Loan Program Office and formerly the Director of the Building Technology Office at the U.S. Department of Energy. And we have Anjali Bamzai, the Senior Advisor on Climate in the Directorate for Geosciences at the National Science Foundation. So we're really lucky to have such a great panel representing these different agencies. I wanna start with two existing examples from the federal partnerships that Caitlin and Julian help lead. So Caitlin, can you provide an example uh, of uh, and an overview of the Climate Adaptation Partnership Program and how this, partner, how this partnership program has uh, catalyzed higher education and several government agencies? Hi, Caitlin Simpson from NOAA, as Costa said, thank you for um, having me here today. And it's nice to see some um, folks from our network here in the audience. So it'll be um, a nice couple of days. Um, so the goal of NOAA's Climate Adaptation Partnerships, or CAP program, which is formerly known as RESA, some of you might know that, uh, we changed our name to better reflect um, our goals and objectives in developing partnerships both um, across the federal government and universities and colleges, as well as um, the higher education organizations and communities and practitioners that we serve, thus the new name. So our goal is to advance equitable adaptation through sustained regional research and community engagement. Our network of primarily university-based teams carry out a variety of projects focused on regional issues related to climate change and extreme events. These projects span sectoral, environmental, and social concerns, but are rooted in a bottom-up expression of social um, and local need. We have over 20 years of experience working with the university communities on these issues, and we learn a great deal from our network um, every time we interact with them. So it, it, it truly is um, a great learning experience. We currently have 12 uh, CAP teams in different regions of the US. They were chosen through an open competitive process when we compete each region every five years. All of our teams draw from an inter interdisciplinary mix of social, behavioral, physical, engineering, and natural sciences. Our teams are addressing the complexity of interacting socioeconomic and climatic stressors 
as they work with local communities, and we feel this is really important not to silo the, the climate issues and the social and economic issues, but really tackle them together. Um, our teams work with NGOs, local and state governments, um, to co-design the research agenda and co-develop new knowledge tools and strategies for adaptation. They're in the places that they serve, this is important for us, so that they can build trust and partnership in a sustained manner. We focus on the regional scale, regional to local, so that we can undertake cross-jurisdictional analysis and share that work within and across our regions. So for each region, one university or other institution of higher learning hosts the team, but they co-lead, pull from, um, and distribute resources across multiple universities and colleges within that geography. So we've been asking university leadership recently as a whole to step up to support our work on adaptation um, through our teams, through things such as fellowships, communication support, in-kind support of faculty, and other creative solutions. We really want the broader universities on board and not just our teams in doing this really important work with the communities. I could pick any of our teams as great examples of this work, so it's always hard to choose, um, but Costa said pick one. Um, so I'll just give a, a very brief um, synopsis of what our Northeast CAP team, CC Run, is doing. They're led by Columbia University, but they involve five other universities in Boston, New York City, New Jersey, and Philadelphia, where the team works with state and local agencies, local NGOs, on issues ranging from public health, infrastructure, stormwater management, and tackle issues such as extreme heat and coastal flooding in communities within these cities and for the cities as a whole. So they have partnerships with the mayor's office, they get down to the neighborhood level, they work with state agencies, so they really scale up and down and across in these regions. This team's led by a social science geographer, a climate scientist, and an engineer, so you can already see at the leadership level the mix of perspectives and disciplines. Um, all of the team members also leverage funding from multiple federal and state agencies, which is critical for these partnerships in order to tackle the complexity of the issues involved. And finally, um, I'll just point out that this team in particular, but a lot of our teams do this, as I said, they get down to the local level. In this case, they're working with very low income community um, faced with frequent and ongoing flooding in Jamaica Bay, New York City, and they're working with them to analyze not just the flood risk, but the economic cost of a range of adaptation options and strategies, which apparently in this dialogue really opened um, both the researchers and community members' um, eyes to what could potentially be done um, in, in this um, area that's uh, prone to flooding. So I think I'll leave it at that. I know Costa has other questions for us, so I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I'm really excited that you were mentioning the leadership of social sciences in, in this uh, clean energy and climate smart transition. We in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy recognize and elevate the social sciences as a, as a key member and a co-producer and leader uh, to make sure that this is a transition that leaves nobody behind. I wanna uh, ask Julian, because Julian, um, we hear a lot about the climate hubs. We wanna find ways that, uh, that communities and universities and campuses everywhere can uh, emulate, replicate, and grow the types of programs that the climate hubs uh, uh, do. But maybe just help our, our audience understand what are the climate hubs program uh, and how, has they, how have they worked across uh, federal university partnerships? Thanks, Costa. And uh, just before I begin, uh, I know this is co-hosted by the University of Washington, but I'm a proud Washington State University grad. I know we have the in-state rivalries, but we do work with the University of Washington. Um, but the USDA Climate Hubs program aims to co-develop and deliver science-based, region-specific information and tools with USDA agencies and our partners uh, to, to agricultural and natural resource managers to really reduce climate risk and build resilience. Uh, we have 10 regions, and thus we have 10 regional hubs. Five are co-hosted at Agricultural Research Service, or ARS sites, which is the in-house research agency at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and five are hosted with the Forest Service R&D. So the Climate Hubs program really embodies this one USDA mission. 
and many of our hubs are also co-located at land-grant universities and if not have cooperative agreements with universities and even community colleges. And while our staff are mostly federal, the hubs partner with other, other federal agencies like FEMA, EPA, but also state agencies, universities, cooperative extension, agricultural advisors, farmers, ranchers, and landowners. It is really all hands on deck. Our climate hubs serve as a regional resource on climate information relevant to agriculture, forestry, and, and climate impacts on rural communities. And we really help to provide venues for that two-way flow of information between practitioners and researchers, and as Caitlin mentioned, really building trust and sustaining relationships on the ground. Further, we know, we know that our nation's farmers, foresters, and ranchers are facing increased vulnerability to their operations to extreme weather and long-term climate change. So the question is, what can we do? The hubs do partner with universities on a variety of resources, including scientific syntheses, including climate impacts and risk assessments, um, to tool and technology development, climate change educational modules, and enhanced multimedia that supports adoption and application and really catalyzing the uh, adoption and application of climate smart agriculture and forestry practices. One specific example I wanted to mention is called GrassCast, and that's an experimental grassland forecast that essentially helps ranchers and rangeland managers determine how much forage is available on the landscape in the upcoming growing season. And that's a partnership with our Northern Plains Climate Hub, Agricultural Research Service, National Drought Mitigation Center, Colorado State University, and the University of Arizona. The last point I wanna make is that with USDA's extramural fund funding arm, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, kind of like the NSF for USDA, NIFA and the Climate Hubs are strengthening the role of extension as a force multiplier in increasing the adoption and application of climate smart adaptation practices. With a presence in nearly all of the more than 3,000 counties of the United States, Cooperative Extension Systems Network of agents and specialists will be essential to expanding the use of climate smart strategies and delivering them with our communities. One specific project I wanted to mention out of fiscal year 2021 from NIFA um, is led by the Desert Research Institute and the University of Nevada, Reno. And that new project will strengthen the role of the USDA climate hubs and tribal extension in enhancing native agroecosystem resilience through expansion of climate services and outreach with our Southwest and Northern Plains climate hub regions. Lastly, I just wanted to mention that throughout our work, we never wanna forget the word culture and agriculture. We wanna ensure that our resources and tools really focus on place and people. So ensuring that our tools and resources and assessments are producer, people, community centered, but also realize they have to be local and uh, place based. So thank you. Thanks, Julian. The, the role of extension is critical in making sure that communities, uh, the federal government and university and, and, and other higher ed education institutions are working together to deliver these climate smart communities. All right, let's go over to the Department of Energy with our friend uh, David. Now, David, uh, you're now at the loan program office, but you led the building technology office um, at the Department of Energy. I want to hear about the opportunities, you know, given these two experiences there, Maybe help us understand the opportunities to break down silos between research, demonstration, uh, and, and deployment, and leverage the capabilities of the higher education community to get what Jigger Shaw calls project bankability and steel in the ground for these net zero communities. Uh, thank you, Costa. And, and let me just say thanks to OSTP, to you and Rachel and OSTP and your colleagues for organizing. Uh, today's meeting. Well, this is not my first day in Washington, so I'm going to answer the question I want to answer rather than the question Costa. <laughs> just at least I'm honest about it. But my other line was, uh, as we say in Washington, everything's been said, but not everybody has said it. And so I'm going to do a little of that too. But first, I need to do a survey so I can um, I can properly pigeonhole all of you. I'm going to ask you by a show of hands. You can answer more than once. How do you, do you self-identify as a hard science person? Do you identify as a, including math and engineering, or as a social science person, including uh, policy and government? So, uh, hard science, just. Not, <laughs> not science is hard. hard. And uh, social sciences and, and management, et cetera, okay. It looks almost half and half cost. Oh, you got a couple of doubles. Here's my real survey question. How many of you will tell us that the or, uh, university or organization that you're associated with is doing everything it can on clean energy and clim climate, everything? And if I see one hand, <laughs> I'm throwing you out because you're not. I've never met you and I know you're not. 
And the thing we have to remember, it's implicit. I just want to say, I, as far as I'm concerned, I've been doing this since I was a sophomore and I got assigned a paper. Uh, why did Brown University not have an energy efficient heating plant? And I'm doing it to this day and you can see it's been a while <laughs> since I was a sophomore. But what I want to say is, look, we have two existential threats facing this planet, climate and uh, the risk of nuclear war. And you pick your I'm not competing for first or second place on that. I just know that climate's one of those two. And I'm not going to end this, I'm not going to say at any point, unless we, uh, we'll never solve our climate problems unless we do X. Because no matter how you finish that sentence, it's always true. Because we have to do everything, whether it's working with uh, a disenfranchised or LMI people, whether it's transportation or buildings, which is my thing. We've got to do it all. So that's a meaningless statement. Whenever somebody pitches you or pitches us, and when you come pitch us, if you say, unless we do your thing, I'll say, well, of course, because we have to do everything. I'm going to give you a couple more pointers about the mysterious beast of the federal government. I've only been a Fed for a few years, but uh, I spent most of my career outside of government, but I've been long enough that I feel like I can make fun of the, uh, our collective, our collective uh, institution, the U.S. government, a little bit. So I'm going to focus on buildings, thinking about what Costa asked me to get to. Uh, so building, we have 130 million buildings in this country, right? You work in one, I, I, hope, you, I hope you sleep in one. And um, of those 130 million, about 123 million are residences, everything from single family to multifamily to institutional and dormitories. And of the uh, five and a half million uh, uh, commercial buildings, hospitals, retail, historic buildings such as this one. Together, those 130 million buildings consume 39% of U.S. energy. That's more than any other sector. 74% of U.S. electricity, by, by definition, much more than any other sector. Over $400 billion per annum, of which over easily 100 to $150 billion is simply wasted, provides no legitimate service like lighting, heating, cooling, uh, locomotion. And for climate, Luckily, we're in second place, for CO2, excuse me, we're in second place at about 33% transportation, still worse than us. But what I'm trying to say here is buildings which are, not to you guys because you're smart, but to most Americans, they're silent. They're silent polluters. And just stating the obvious there, and, uh, and so that's why it's so important to focus on buildings. Because I think it, I would submit in a lot of ways it's the sleeping giant of our fight against climate. And when I say buildings, it could be a place to charge your EV. It could be a place to teach uh, uh, undergrads or grads a course on uh, social activism as climate policy. It could, be a, uh, uh, it could be all sorts of things, but it typically uh, happens in buildings and they tend to be the hub. So the work that I want to cite, Costa, is the work that uh, I did when I was at the Building Technologies Office, which we called Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings, and then if you have a bunch of these grid interactive buildings, you could have a c connected community or a smart community, I won't argue that. Or now in my office, we call them virtual power plants because they act like power plants, they're virtual. And that's an opportunity for universities and for us to take research into big data, uh, controls, sensors, lighting, and put them together to, so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I, that's the one message I want to lead with. And that's true for all of us. We try not to live in silos, but we work for big agencies. It's very easy to fall into a silo. I suspect, it's, I think it's better in academia, but it's always still a risk that we need to connect things. And not just for our intellectual interest, but because um, uh, when it comes to energy, in particular, I'm just focusing on clean energy today, not the rest of our uh, climate needs, that we won't be able to uh, uh, optimize unless we can tie together because residences use, have a different energy use patterns than office buildings. And some buildings are friendly to solar more than they consume and others, a hospital can't go local solar. It needs some centralized. So it's that optimization, that control. And so the R&D, I will say, not all of it is heavy lifting. Some of it is uh, uh, organic substrates for organic LEDs, but most of it tends to be in the area of controls uh, economics, optimization, and engineering. So just want to put that out there. Universities, um, you guys do it all. You have it all. You're not the only researchers in the world. You're not the only buildings in the world, but you have it all in one place. Um, and we have a lot of money at DOE. I guess I should have led with that, right? 
Well, thank you, David. Imagine what we could have gotten done if you had started your first year in college, not your sophomore year. So we, 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 you, owe us, you owe us one year. Um, and I guess you, you issued a call to action here, which is uh, university, campus communities, institutes of higher education, asking their leadership, do we have a virtual power plant, right? And why not? So let's, let's turn now to the National Science Foundation and um, to Anjali. Uh, it's really an exciting time at, at NSF, and there's a deep relationship between NSF and the higher education community. I want to get your perspective of what you see as what works. What's the successful examples of big initiatives from NSF that connect higher education institutions uh, to communities? Okay, thank you, Costa. First of all, let me wish everyone a happy International Women's Day today. Today is March 8th. So yes, indeed, it's a very exciting time to be at NSF. As you heard from Dr. Eisen, uh, we have a new directorate, the Technology, Innovation, and Partnership Directorate. It's the first ever in 30 years. And the need for that arose from the fact that we have curiosity-driven research, we have youth-inspired research, and then we want to move this into solution space for the market, economy, et cetera, and to have a thriving planet but not at the expense of you know, having uh, horrendous climate change to face and having to manage the unavoidable, et cetera. So we want to do it in a deliberate and a good way, uh, having virtuous, uh, creating virtuous cycles of various usages. So first thing I want to say about, you mentioned the social, behavioral, and economic uh, uh, being so important and critical to this enterprise. So at NSF, we pride ourselves because we have all the science directorates, the biological sciences, the ecosystems, geosciences, where we study the foundation of climate engineering, where much of the clean energy research takes place. We have computational information science, and now, of course, we have TIP. So we already have an ecosystem where we can look in a problem-solving way, in a convergent way, convergent research, to take a problem and see what are the disciplines, what are, where are the bottlenecks, and what do we need to do. Talking about some of the large initiatives, uh, uh, several come to mind, but uh, uh, you know, about a decade back, we had the uh, sustainable uh, uh, science, engineering, and education for sustainability, which was the CEAS initiative. In fact, we had uh, we uh, collaborated with USDA and NIFA on that one, and then through the years, we've had uh, coastlines and people. We realized that a lot of people, uh, uh, hum humanity is along the coastlines, and we need coastal resilience. So we have projects uh, uh, under COPE. We have navigating the new Arctic. We know that Arctic change is taking place at a horrendous rate, and we want to understand better how to navigate and what would be the future of this planet with the changing Arctic. Uh, I can think of Civic. Civic is a new innovative program which is stakeholder-driven. So we talked about taking the knowledge uh, creation and then the knowledge dissemination and then taking it to practice. So how about if we flip it? So Civic, the Civic program looks at what is the stakeholder saying? What, uh, you know, can we gear and uh, funnel our research priorities based on what the stakeholder priorities are? So for example, an, uh, an interesting project that Civic has uh, funded is uh, looking at transit. Uh, so you have uh, micro -ta transit where you can sort of optimize uh, based on what the stakeholder uh, interests are. You know, you find that sometimes you have these uh, transit uh, and, and because they haven't taken stakeholder input, uh, the results are not, are not that promising. So Civic, there's an interesting a project that's looking at Phoenix, I believe, and they're uh, gearing it so that you can arrange the microtransit route, so, which uh, it's stakeholder driven. And so you can have much more chance of success and it will be used. And that leads to actually energy usage savings on the energy usage side of things. Um, I want to say that we have very ambitious goals set ahead of us. You know, we have to uh, reduce our uh, greenhouse gas emissions 50% by 2030 based on 2015 baseline. And then we also want to go net zero by 2050. So if we want to get there, we really have to address a whole bunch of problems in a convergent research approach 
And uh, yeah, so those are some of the large ones, navigating the new Arctic Cope, CEVIC. On the tip, we have Convergence Accelerator. I think that came up before. And there are some interesting tracks there. What, uh, the most recent one, I think it was just announced earlier this week, that there will be a solicitation coming out in water equitable solutions. And so that's a heads up to the community on that one. And thank you so much, Anjali. As we've heard, there's these big opportunities um, for partnerships uh, between the federal government and higher education institutions. But one thing that's really important to the president and to the vice president and to the entire Biden-Harris administration is that this clean energy and climate smart transition include everybody and leave nobody behind. And so I wanted to get some uh, feedback, uh, examples, uh, perspective from the panel about uh, how are best pr what are some best practices to center and elevate equity and justice in this climate uh, smart transition. Um, I'll take the first crack at this. Um, so, so as I said, we're a program, uh, proposal-driven program at the start. Um, the university community uh, submits proposals, and in this, when we have our call for proposals, we start with asking our applicants to first uh, bring in a wider set of organizations. So this can include MSIs, HBCUs, community colleges, tribal colleges, along with you know, some of the bigger universities that we tend to um, get applying to, to our program. Um, and this also helps us get more grounded in the local communities and in these regions um, than we have in the past. We ask them to think about equity and justice in, in not just um, who they work with, but how they conduct their research and show us a plan for that and how they're doing their engagement. And then one thing we've been experimenting with recently in the last just couple of years um, is to work with the universities and provide funding for what we're calling small grants to frontline organizations. And this is an experiment for us. All our teams are doing this a little bit differently so that we can learn from it. Um, but instead of frontline communities and organizations, these smaller ones that may not have the capacity to apply to the federal government for funding, um, we're going through the universities and having the universities set up a system that's less burdensome for these communities, and um, and also they have trust in these you know in these local communities. When we're doing it through frontline organizations, so that they can reach multiple communities, this is an experiment for us. So stay tuned. We're going to figure out how to evaluate it and learn from our network in doing so. So I'll just leave it at that. I think. And uh, from the USDA Climate Hub's perspective, uh, we are a covered program under the Justice 40 initiative. And as part of that, we are thinking about how to center equity in the work that we do, including looking at how we can better deliver on USDA programs so we leave no one behind, using some of our tools and technologies to look at those cold spots and where we're not delivering those important conservation, federal crop insurance, and other disaster assistance payments program that we know our farmers and ranchers need. Um, second, I will mention that through the NIFA Climate Hubs Extension Partnership Grant, we are looking to also support underserved producers and work with MSIs such as the University of Puerto Rico and the University of Virgin Islands Extension where they're working with historically underserved communities throughout the US Caribbean and other coastal areas. And finally, I do wanna latch on to Caitlin's comment. It's really important to meet stakeholders where they are and really listen and learn to their needs and concerns. And I think you know, the Climate Hub's really poised to continue uh, leveraging that message across the department, but also working with our partners across the USG. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, uh, NSF has about 2,000 institutions that it funds across the, all 50 states and international as well. Uh, we are quite sensitive to the fact that we need to broaden participation across institutions. And so we have some programs. Most recently, the granted program is to help navigate some of the you know, emerging research institutions and some that are not HBCUs, et cetera, who are sort of underserved, uh, and help them navigate through the NSF space. And so there's a whole lot of webinars that have been taking place. We had some listening sessions. Uh, and based on that, we came to the conclusion that some of the sponsored research uh, offices in these institutions may not be that, uh, you know, 
up to speed as, say, the tier ones, and so we're particularly sensitive about that. So we do want to uh, have, the, we have the mantra that we want innovation anywhere and opportunities everywhere. So a lot of our programs, I can think of excellence in research as being one, and in, in the Geosciences Directorate, we have several geopaths, and one uh, most recently, I think, uh, yeah, so Brandon Jones and Lena Patino would be the points of contact, but yes, we do, uh, in the uh, space of climate, we want to reach to all uh, people because we know that the, there's a disproportionate impact of climate change, and some communities are facing it harder than others, so we yeah, so that's how we're dealing with that. Real quick, uh, I'll concur with all that, but I want to key off something Caitlin said and Julian followed up with. Look, my agency, I think even more than yours, I think, was built to do really big things. It was splitting atoms 80 years ago. Um, and then now we do, uh, we're better at it, but we still do offshore wind and nuclear power plants. We're not as good, this is what I get paid to do now, is to work on smaller things and more localized things and to work with different constituencies. And so we're trying, but there's just a lot of, I just want to say there's a lot of institutional uh, inertia, is that the word I'm looking for? Not resistance anymore, but I think just inertia to be able to do small, specialized things. And so I think um, for LMI and other disadvantaged, disenfranchised communities, it's difficult and we need intermediaries, whether it's universities or state governments or other players to help help facilitate that so that we can be helpful. It's, it's hard for us to do it directly, at DOE at least. Okay. Well, you know, a lot of the discussion uh, that, that we hear in the general discourse around climate uh, sometimes is separated in between climate mitigation and climate resilience and climate smart communities. And I think that the time for merging these two is, is, long, is long overdue. And I wanted to get your sense of are there opportunities, are there good examples that our, our higher education communities can partner with or emulate uh, that merge climate resilience and climate mitigation? We don't have to use the same order, but yes. <laughs> okay, I feel always on the spot. But, but okay. Yeah, um, yeah we, we talk a lot in our network about the adaptation work we're doing and how we can think about mitigation. And again, this is more at the local level, sometimes the state level, but more at the local level for things like stormwater management or thinking about cooling centers and um, bringing climate change into that mix. Um, and we know we need to be thinking about also, you know, the some of the city, cities have energy efficiency uh, standards that they need to meet and how are they gonna meet those while they're improving their stormwater management or building cooling centers. So we know these are, these are all important questions. I think we're maybe first trying to get to how can we think more about transformational adaptation and change that's more transformational that could work for adaptation and then bring in mitigation because we know a lot of the adaptation right now is incremental and it's not um, transformational where you're thinking about institutions and governance and laws and policies that are really gonna make um, big changes. So, so I definitely hear you. I think for us, government partnerships, um, our teams leverage a lot of work. They do get some DOE funding, NSF funding, USDA funding um, to try to bring all of this into their uh, into the complexity, um, and so so I agree with you. I think that's a a long term thing for both bringing in mitigation to adaptation and thinking about transformational change. Can, can I say that um, first? Let's acknowledge there are some trade offs here, and we have to do what you said. We have to do both, but there are trade offs. A lot. I'm again thinking of buildings. A lot of the resilience solutions lead to poor, lead to greater energy consumption. Uh, concrete buildings, overbuilding, overpowering. So. We have to first do no harm, but then on the positive side, I think the best role, and it's on the research and demonstration side for universities, are, are I won't say new materials, advanced materials. There are materials and construction techniques that can do both those things. And it could be things as old as wood, advanced cross-laminated timber, duh, but uh, uh, using wood which captures carbon or, or low E carbon or better yet, construction techniques using big data and robotics that just uses less concrete 
to build the structure and still have all the energy and resilience performance. So that it, the, the construction industry invests less than almost any industry in this country on R&D. The average productivity of a home builder today, output per hour, is less, I'm going to depress you right now, is less than when World War II ended. True fact. So we need some help. The industry won't do it. We need to do what you guys need to. Just very briefly, I think on the agriculture and forestry side, we always think about co-benefits right, related to adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. And I think in that solution space, that is a, a really key area where it's not one or the other, and they shouldn't be battling against each other. Yeah, I look at adaptation as uh, uh, managing the unavoidable and mitigation as avoiding the unmanageable. So actually, yeah, in our minds, we have thought of it as two separate things, but it is a spectrum. And in case we can get to uh, some uh, sweet spot of, you know, looking at doing, doing our, our actions in adaptation, also leading to mitigation, that would be the optimum solution, of course. But uh, in general, uh, we know that uh, the, at least the temperature impacts of climate change are upon us, and we're going to see these extremes, and so we're going to have to adapt uh, in short order and uh, also work towards the larger-term goals of mitigating by, uh, you know, doing carbon capture and carbon sequestration and removing the carbon, which is having, and other greenhouse gases. So I agree with you in principle. Thanks, everyone. So for our last question, I, I, you know, we're going to be brief. Uh, and so, uh, how can uh, how can the the federal partnerships that you all lead, and the rest of the federal partnerships that are around um, the government, uh, meet the moment for the speed and scale required to get to half uh, have our greenhouse gas emissions in 2030 and uh, net zero by 2050? So we can start with when and really we, we, well, well, let me start with Angelia, and then yeah. we can we can go down the line. Well, we are optimistic that some of our investments uh, will yield the results. And so we have a lot of things in the pipeline. And, you know, if you look back, uh, like 120 years ago, when we didn't have these bulbs, and then there came Thomas Edison, and then there was light, and then there was Tesla, and there was AC. So we hope that there will be some disruptive technologies based on the investments we've made so that we can get to those goals. And of course, working in interagency partnership is most important. Again, it's a spectrum. NSF may be more in the R&D space, and then down further down south, it's uh, further downstream, I want to say. Uh, it's uh, taking the results and making them into, say, lo loan guarantee programs, then practice, et cetera. So hopefully, I, I have faith in both science and technology that we, with all the investments the federal government has made, that we it will yield the results. Four words, please come our way. I'm putting it on you. We have a lot of money at DOE and the other agencies now, but we're not good at that. We get stuck inside the beltway, inside our buildings. We're busy, we're hardworking, um, but it, it's just the reality. And so if you can come our ways, I think there'll be a lot of opportunities. And look, government isn't, it's not a con, no, it's not quite a contact sport, but the, the reality is COVID really interfered with our productivity, of course, and our ability to deal with uh, our constituent, with, uh, with uh, citizens and residents and taxpayers. So I just really encourage you, just knock on our doors. I think you'll find responsive audiences throughout the U.S. government. But um, I'm putting it on you guys. I just want to put for the record that that was more than four words, just FYI, David, so uh, please. Uh. Um, I would just really quickly say that um, in addition to thinking about scaling up, we actually talk about scaling deep, which for us is trying to figure out how best to reach these frontline communities as more equal partners and learning from that so that when we do this community work and we're scaling across these communities, we're doing a better job. I think in addition to scaling out and up, I think we also need to reach in and reach out, really changing that institutional inertia. As we know, climate change is also changing and affecting how we do our own work, so how we work with you all to really affect the change within my department, for example, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and increasing our own climate literacy needs. 
Well, we're really uh, grateful for this wonderful panel. Uh, I'm grateful for Anjali mentioning Thomas Edison, who had a office here in the White House. And so maybe we can channel that spirit of innovation uh, for reaching our climate smart and net zero communities and, and have inclusive innovation for everyone in the United States and beyond. So thank, thanks to our panel. Looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you so much to our first panel. Um, we're now going to do a quick transition. I'll invite the second panel to come up to the table. We're going to shift gears a little bit now to two panels full of leaders from a diverse group of colleges and universities across the country. This first group is going to emphasize how they um, do and can partner with their communities. I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Todd Kroll, the director of the Institute for the Environment at Florida International University, to get us started in just a minute. All right, well, good, good afternoon. Uh, we want to start by thanking OSTP and the University of Washington for hosting this panel on the role of university community partnerships in finding effective knowledge and especially actions uh, in the context of climate change and sustainability. My name is Todd Crow. I'm the Institute of Environment Director at Florida International University, one of the nation's largest majority minority serving institutions in the country. Campuses across all 50 of, of the states are deeply engaged with their local communities, institutions, and state governments. Serving our communities is increasingly recognized as a core mission of universities in addition to the fundamental research and education we provide. Engaging communities to understand the knowledge and information that they need, what we call co-production of knowledge, is an essential step to build trust and effective communication, especially with complicated issues like climate change. Today, communities and regions are faced with many questions as they navigate the journey towards resilience, including green energy solutions, the use of green infrastructure, and an equitable path to health, wealth, and happiness. Uh, to hear more about these efforts, we have, five, have representatives from five colleges and universities across the country to share their experience and talk about their experiences and what they're doing. What we'll do now is go through the panel for a very brief introduction about e themselves. I'll start with Laura Skinner, who's the Executive Director of the Climate Jobs Institute at Cornell University. Great. Thank you so much, Todd, and um, for everyone for including me in today's important discussion. As Todd said, my name's Lara Skinner. I'm the Executive Director of the Climate Jobs Institute at Cornell University uh, within the School of Industrial and Labor Relations, the ILR School at Cornell. And our institute studies the labor and employment impacts of climate change and the transition to a zero carbon economy. So we spend a lot of time studying what this transition is going to mean for labor and employment for workers, for workplaces, different economic sectors. And then we also act as a resource to the labor movement, to legislators and others to ensure that as we tackle climate change, we're also creating high quality jobs, we're creating as many jobs as we can, that these are good high quality jobs that support uh, families and communities, and that we're building the diverse and inclusive clean energy workforce that we need so that we're centering frontline communities as we build out this economy. Um, so we do a lot of work uh, conducting applied research on working conditions and new clean energy sectors, studying um, uh, the conditions, uh, what are the job losses and gains in this transition, and then we design what we call worker and equity centered climate policy and I'll talk more about our work in a minute. So thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Gerard Mellencon, founder and director of Durango Works and director of the National Green Jobs Advisory Council and a Baton Rouge Community College. No, well, thank you, Todd, and it's an honor to be here. But uh, first of all, I kind of like to say, you know, why I really love workforce development. Uh, I grew up in a very uh, rural uh, part of America and where I saw opportunity and hope kind of move out. My parents were part of the Great Migration up north. And then I saw despair and crime moved in, in the town I, I truly love in Kankakee, Illinois. Um, but what really <laughs> intrigued me about workforce development, instead of become a crime fighter, I, I saw how, you know, workforce development can really transform these communities and get them out of this economic hell that they're in, like Kankakee, Illinois, and now where I reside in, in Louisiana, to really bring true heaven on earth for disconnected populations, only if done extremely well and consider all the nuances in workforce development. 
This is why I really love working with my organization, with the National Council for Workforce Education, NCWE. And NCWE um, has been around, it's not new to the game, but they've been around for about 50 years. And it, we also have adopted the Seed Center, um, and I'll talk a little more about the Seed Center. But the really beauty of all this is providing inclusive solutions mm -hmm. for the voiceless in higher ed. And I do want to have to do, do kind of a plug. Um, uh, this year we have our annual conference here in Baltimore. It rotates year after year, so it's kind of apropos that we'll be in Baltimore this year in October. And most importantly, we are affiliated organizations from the American Associations of Community Colleges. Great. Thank you very much, Gerard. Next we have Erica Fleischman, Director of the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute at Oregon State University. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. I direct the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, OCRI for short, and I'm a professor in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. I was born and raised in the DC area, which I think probably makes me the only Commander's fan in Oregon. <laughs> Don't any of you say the only Commander's fan, period. Um, but also, I, I'm named for my great grandma. She was an illiterate immigrant to the United States. I'm the first woman in my family uh, to have had the opportunity to go to college, let alone to get an advanced degree. And I believe very strongly that having an education and being in the university system doesn't make me better than anyone else. It doesn't make me smarter than anyone else, but it really makes me extraordinarily lucky. And so I am grateful to be at Oregon State University, which is the land grant for Oregon, and to be part of its mission of increasing access to education and workforce development, and to making those opportunities increasingly inclusive. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Next, we have Matthew Richardson, Acting Director of the Center for Urban Research, Engagement, and Scholarship at the University of the District of Columbia, and tomorrow's host for our workshop. Thank you, Todd, and good afternoon, everybody. So as Todd said, I am Matthew Richardson, the Acting Director of the Center for Urban Research, Engagement, and Scholarship here at UDC in the nation's capital. We are an HBCU, an 1862 land grant, and the only public institution of higher education here in the district. We strive to create healthy cities so that we can improve the health of the people living in those cities. We focus particularly on marginalized groups because they are the ones who are disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis and other environmental degradation. We also work with people of all ages so that we're ensuring equity, inclusion, diversity, as well as resilience, sustainability for our communities. And we're well poised to do this work because of our unique mission, and we integrate our cooperative extension, our academic, and our research programs. So on behalf of UDC, I want to welcome those of you from out of state to our community, and we're really looking forward to hosting you on our campus tomorrow. Great. Thank you, Matthew. And finally, Robert Kopp, co-director of the University Office of Climate, Act Climate Action at Rutgers University. Thanks, Todd. Uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for being here. Um, as Todd mentioned, um, I'm at Rutgers University. I'm a climate scientist. I have a tendency to say yes to too many things, so I'm just going to sort of go through a few of those roles as a way of, intro of introducing some of the sorts of partnerships Rutgers builds to link research and education uh, to climate action. Uh, so at a campus level, I serve as co-director of the University Office of Climate Action. Uh, which is responsible for holding all parts of the university to account for the commitments made in our Climate Action Plan, as well as for catalyzing collaborations between the operational and academic arms of the university to support those goals, and to advance uh, the scholarly study of climate action in higher education. At more of a regional level, I serve as the director of one of those coastlines and people's hubs that Anjali was talking about, the Megalopolitan Coastal Transformation Hub, or MOC, uh, which is a collaborative of 13 institutions uh, that's working with stakeholder partners in the Mid-Atlantic region, particularly Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New York City, to advance both the science and the practice of coastal climate risk management in dense, sprawling megaregions. Um, I'm also part of the team uh, leading a graduate program at Rutgers intended to train the workforce needed to bridge the science and practice of climate risk management, um, as well as a faculty advisor to our um, sort of state-supported climate services center, the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center. Um, and then finally, at sort of more of a, a national policy level, um, I'm one of the directors of the Climate Impact Lab, which is a multi-institutional collaborative and nonprofit that links climate science, climate economics, 
data science and policy engagement uh, to help integrate climate risk into state, national, and global economic policy. Thank you very much, Bob. Okay, Laura, you're a leader in job creation and economic development while still protecting the climate. Why is it important and what role can universities play to help maximize the jobs and economic benefits of the clean energy economy? Great, thanks. Yeah, the, the place that I would like to start is with how we approach this work. And it's from the premise that we're facing two crises, not one. That yes, we have a climate crisis that we have to address, but also that we have a crisis of inequality that we're facing at the same time. And inequality of income, race, gender, wealth, opportunity is at historic proportions in this country. So that's our starting point. And as New York State's labor school, we know that one of the best ways to deal with inequality is to make sure that we're maximizing job creation as we build out this clean energy economy and that the new jobs that we're creating are high quality, good jobs that support workers and communities, their families. Um, uh, through this transition. And I think the other thing that we think a lot about is how historic this transition is, and I'm sure others of you in this room do as well. Dealing with climate change is a historic transition that requires change in every part of our economy. We are and we will eliminate jobs. There's no doubt about that. We're already seeing that. Um, it's going to be disruptive. It's going to be hard. And we need to figure out how to protect and support workers and communities through this transition. And that means that the benefits and the burdens of this transition are shared equitably. Um, and that we provide the support that impacted communities need to, to make it through the transition and land in a place that is as good as or better than they were before uh, the transition. And I'll just give you one example of that. When the Indian Point nuclear plant closed down in New York, it provided a third of New York's power, so it was a big energy issue. Um, it also employed over 1,000 workers, and it provided about $30 million a year in tax revenue to the local community that went to schools and to the local government. It's a big hole that we have to figure out how to to fill, and 90 days notice of a plant closure is not enough time to figure out how to, how to make that transition. Um, on the flip side, of course, we're going to create a lot of new jobs um, as we navigate this transition and build out the climate and clean energy economy we need. Most estimates are that we'll create about 15 to 25 million new jobs just in the next decade. Um, and it will likely be more. So, you know, but I would say that, you know, not all climate investments are equal. We need to focus on the activities that will create the most jobs for local communities. Um, so let me give you another example here. Building offshore wind. The whole East Coast is now talking about building offshore wind projects. The West Coast is starting as well. Um, the majority of jobs in offshore wind are not in the construction of those towers and turbines. They're actually in the manufacturing and assembly. So what are we doing in our policy to actually ensure that we're manufacturing and assembling parts of these projects in the U.S., in local communities, and providing those jobs? Um, I just did a trip to the U.K. The U.K. has built 12 gigawatts of offshore wind. That's a lot of wind. And we said, what happened? And they said, we didn't, we didn't get any jobs. Um, you know, workers from other parts of the world came in and built the projects, and the products were, you know, manufactured in other places and floated to the UK. So it's a cautionary tale, you know, in us thinking about how we build out um, our clean energy economy. Um, and then, of course, the other pieces were, you know, how do we maximize job creation as we build out this economy, but how do we also, also make sure that these new jobs are high-quality good jobs? Um, you can't have a just transition if there aren't good jobs to transition to. Um, and so, you know, the last thing that a worker wants who's been working in a you know, coal plant, operating a coal plant for decades with a, you know, high school GED or less you know, receiving good wages and benefits is to be told that, you know, you can, you can have a short-term job in the solar industry paying $15 an hour now, right? So that job quality issue is really important here. Our institute is currently conducting a study of working conditions in the solar industry in New York State and Texas. And our preliminary results showed that the majority of workers in the residential solar sector are paid by the number of panels that they install per day. That's not okay. Uh, that's peace rate work. It's actually illegal. Um, and it's going to exacerbate the inequality that we already have in this country. So um, when we do this work, we work closely with labor unions, legislators, and policymakers. And we're really focused on four things as we help them design what we call climate jobs programs. First is not on what needs to be shut down, but what do we need to build to address climate change? And we get very specific and concrete mapping out what needs to be built in the state. Uh, to meet the state's climate targets. Second, how do we do it in a way that maximizes job creation? 
Third, how do we make sure that these are going to be good jobs? You know, President Biden and his administration did a fantastic job with this in the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, basically projects developers receive much greater incentivization if they pay prevailing wage, if they utilize registered apprentices, if they source products built in the U.S., and if they locate projects in frontline communities of color, environmental justice communities. So that's a good example of how we tailor the policy to meet these goals. And then, of course, how do we ensure that communities that need the jobs most are getting them, right? How are we centering these investments in frontline communities of color? These are the four things that we're thinking about. And then based on this orientation, we've been able to design what we call climate jobs programs for eight U.S. states and then help build coalitions of unions, environmental organizations, industry partners, and others to actually run campaigns and advance these recommendations that we've developed that meet these climate jobs and equity goals. And then the, the last part I would say is how we do the work I think is just as important as what we're doing. So we lead these organizations through a multi-year highly iterative research policy training and education process. So we're on the ground doing hundreds of interviews in each state, understanding people's experience. What's happening? You know, how are you experiencing this transition? Are you seeing new jobs? What type of jobs? You know, what are you concerned about when you get hit by climate events? What's happening? And then we use those experiences to inform our research agenda. Uh, then we come back to them, we present the research to them. It's, you know, highly participatory, um, you know, uh, iterative process, and then use that to develop the, the policies that, um, uh, that we're creating. And then, as I said, we develop a very concrete set of climate jobs recommendations for the state. And at the end, the group has sort of a blueprint that they can use to then uh, follow their plans for the state and meet their climate jobs and equity goals. And then the, the last thing I would say is, in addition to needing to have this um, dual focus on climate change and inequality, I think scale, and scale came up a lot in the last panel, is so important. Um, how do we scale this work, right? And scale for me and for the work that we do in our institute and how we think about this stuff is important for a few different reasons. One, we've got to scale to actually meet our emissions reduction targets and what science demands. But second, scale is really important to job creation, right? Um, we're not creating a lot of jobs if we're not figuring out how to scale this work. If we're not retrofitting the number of buildings we need to retrofit per year, if we're not installing the gigawatts of solar and wind and other renewables that we need to uh, be installing each year. So there's a jobs component there. And then the third part I would say is scale would also allow us to orient the world to the communities, the work to the communities that need clean energy investments the most. So for example, we need to move from installing solar on someone's house because they have the money and the means to do it, we should be installing solar and doing energy efficiency retrofits block by block, starting in frontline communities of color that are suffering the most from the energy burden, right? That's how you scale emissions reduction, that's how you scale job creation, and that's how you address equity. Um, and I think having an energy efficient home, an electric vehicle, power from renewables should and can reduce cost for families. And we need to figure out how to make this a reality, especially for, for the communities that need it most. And really crack the nut of, you know, making this transition is actually going to improve people's lives um, and, and lower costs for them. So thank you. Thank you. Gerard, building on Laura, colleges and universities are critical for de developing the next generation of workers for the green economy across all the sectors, positions, and skill levels. Based on your work, how can schools, and particularly community colleges, um, play a role in preparing their communities for emerging clean jobs? No, uh, thank you so much, Todd, for the question. Um, and that's really why we're actually funded by the Lumina Foundation to do this work, and they invested in NCWE uh, to start the National Green Jobs Advisory Council and the SEED Center um, that I mentioned before. And SEED stands for Sustainable Education uh, and Economic Development, is, which will be a national resource center for community colleges for sustainability and clean energy uh, workforce development. But the National Green Job Advisory Council has three focus areas of curriculum, because there's a lot from getting to what Bill Gates like to call 51 billion tons of emissions globally that's being emitted to the air to zero by 2050, provides a lot of opportunities and a lot of things to get paralyzed on. But we decided to kind of clump, to, to, to narrow it down to three areas. One is HVAC, R, include refrigeration. Um, construction, construction is kind of broad because it overlaps a lot with electrical. Electrical, all things, introducing them into solar as to be, like Laura mentioned, as a full solar tech. So you can do troubleshooting of an inverter, battery pack system, and maybe a standby, standby generator. So there's a full technician just not installing panels quickly across the community. And then also transportation. And transportation is so broad. 
where you have your, your, your small car to marine to now aircraft to you know heavy equipment and within that we could spend years on but um, I'll just give a small example on how we're doing that with future you know, said so we're kind of future proofing these careers and these legacy careers I like to call them and and we're focused on one building modules that within our community colleges across the, across the nation they're you know there's electrical programs there's construction programs stuff like that and to change curriculum is very hard I call it the, the inertia committee or the committee of no because it's so hard to change <laughs> curriculum and um, so we just said let's do modules to introduce people and kind of future proof the career because one they may do traditional stick build but we want them to understand the full building performance and and how that plays so they're more versatile when they go in into just do construction and uh, and then now like diesel engine well we still have a need for diesel there's still a diesel a lot of equipment from standby generators to boats to to automotive but there is a technician that we thought was a good crosswalk called the epg and that's electronic power generation it's basically a hybrid diesel you have a, a diesel engine where a diesel engine tech knows inside and out they like diesel they don't like electrical and then you crosswalk into the battery packs into the electric motor and then more important just the simple things of dealing with higher voltage electrical uh, most technicians really don't like to like the electrical side if you're electrical tech and you go troubleshoot electro tech you're kind of a uh, a unicorn so but we need to create you know a whole community of unicorns right now going into the field <laughs> and and uh, so that's why we're doing the crosswalk of a diesel tech to the EPG exposure so they're just exposed they have an understanding they have a better foundation and then more importantly we have so many technicians out in the field who haven't been exposed and we want to future proof them because you just don't want to hear and I'm sure you all just stomach drop when you hear like a layoff department the combustion engine department of engineers are being laid off because they're going electric in that you know at that business so we that's that's why we have the National Green Jobs Advisory Council um, and broadly to meet these needs we, we do have a, a urgency this is really a, for, for a lot of us a once a career opportunities for community college practitioners to work strategically with employers and really progressive community-based organizations and to be smart on building inclusive models of recruiting more BIPOC individuals into our these programs and also more women into these legacy skill craft careers that are future-proof I also cannot state how we cannot overlook the opportunities to work between a two-year and a four-year in graduate level where we should be cross-training our students um, outside of the SILO legacy skill craft programs and the SILO STEM programs even in, within our campuses but across institutional types. We have a huge need for just computer programmers in all of these legacy skill craft careers. Um, uh, you know, you have autonomous heavy equipment trucks being driven right now in mines and in construction sites. Uh, well, there's a lot that needs to be done there. We have AI um, in smart buildings and in energy fields and a lot of remote troubleshooting with all things uh, remote and it just but just remote with AI with a technician from a from a standpoint of, of knowledge or just you know the equipment is over here and you're trying to troubleshoot it you know a thousand miles away that takes a higher level of thinking um, our current and future legacy skill craft professionals to be positioned well in their careers will need to future have future proofed hands-on skills with the thinking of an engineer and very important the thinking of a social scientist to be successful today and moving forward I'm so excited to be working for NCWE and people like you in this room um, to make this a reality and even a norm in higher ed across America thank you so much Gerard Erica you've been very effective in working with local regional and federal partners to understand and prepare for climate change how can the synergies among universities local communities and especially governments be maximized to to ensure our approach to climate adaptation yeah, thank you the the Oregon climate change research Institute or OCRI we have a distinct and powerful and I think ultimately highly transferable model we were not created by the university we were created by the people of Oregon under House Bill 3543 in 2007 and in creating OCRI 
The state recognized that climate change affects the state's economic well-being, it affects our public health, and it affects our environment. The state also recognized in creating ACRI that reducing greenhouse gas emissions reduces the state's reliance on foreign energy sources, and it directly benefits the state and local government, businesses, and residents. And at the same time, creation of ACRI within the state's educational system recognized that institutions of higher education serve the state's interest in public safety, in health, and in peace. And so the, the Oregon Climate Service, the Office of the State Climatologist of Oregon, is embedded within ACRI. Um, many of the state's climate, state climate offices are embedded within the land-grant universities. So both Oregon, um, the Oregon Climate Service and ACRI were hosted by Oregon State University, which is, of course, the state's land-grant university. But explicit in our charge from the people of Oregon is to facilitate collaboration among Oregon's public universities to address climate change and its effects on human and natural systems across the state. And so explicitly in our charge is the types of collaboration that we're discussing over these two days. We're able to draw, for example, from Oregon State University's excellence in atmospheric science research, in our fantastic extension program. At the same time, we're drawing from University of Oregon's law school and journalism school from Portland State University's expertise in serving a large and diverse urban population um, and in addressing sustainability. And then we're collaborating with many of the smaller regional universities across Oregon, so thinking about places like Eastern Oregon University, Southern Oregon University, Oregon Institute of Technology, all of which are serving their local communities and increasing educational access for underserved parts of the state. And in part because of this, explicit mission of collaboration. ACRI and the Oregon Climate Service have earned the trust of the state and of the media and of the general public. So we're turned to as a source of reliable, accurate, and fair uh, information about climate, about climate change, um, be that something that's short term, so you know, how big was that hailstorm? Um, or something that is really long lasting, so the effects of extreme heat, the effects of widespread drought. Um, we're also charged with providing technical assistance to state and local government and to evaluating the state of climate change science and the effects on climate change in the state. So again, we're trusted as being able to provide that information to communities and to decision makers. I'm also really grateful that although we are the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute and the Oregon Climate Service, we are not restricted to working within the state of Oregon. And so it's widely recognized by, by many of us, but not always by particular um, programs at any level of government, that what's going on with climate, with climate change, um, that none of this is restricted to state boundaries or to political boundaries. So for example, we work closely with the National um, Integrated Drought Information System within NOAA. We work with the National Weather Service. We work with any number of federal programs and with our counterparts across the region and beyond. So I think that ACRI and the Oregon Climate Service really are um, illustrating the return on investment that happens when residents and government and institutions of higher education are joining together. We are contributing to safeguarding of livelihoods, cultural identity, and well-being. And by being part of the uh, Oregon State University system and Oregon State University, we're also able to enhance workforce development and to provide educational opportunities. So thank you so much. That's very, very cool. Um, Matthew, with more than eight, way down there somewhere. <laughs> um, uh, the U.S. population, more than 80% of the U.S. population now lives in urban areas. That m means urban food deserts, drinking water, and especially environmental social justice issues are becoming huge in, in those areas. What are the most important collaborations university and urban policy makers need to have right now? Well, thanks, Todd, for that question. And I'm going to go with the very obvious answer to this. Urban residents are the most important collaborators for universities and for urban policy makers. The core business of a university is to educate students. And most of our students and most of our universities are now coming from urban areas. 
The core purpose for urban policymakers should be to help create policies that allow the current urban residents to thrive, to increase their wellness, their health, their prosperity, to increase their equity within cities. But also those policies need to look forward in uh, modeling resilience into their programs and policies. Now, as a university employee, I'm gonna speak from the university perspective right now, but have we as universities really taken into account the full urban experience and what urban challenges are? Have we integrated that across our curricula? And have we invited urban residents in to help educate us as institutions and to collaborate on our programs? I would say the, the short answer is no, we haven't fully done that. And if you talk to marginalized groups, they'll tell you that many of these environmental and social justice challenges aren't becoming prevalent, but it's been part of their reality for generations. And they're looking to universities to partner, but it has to be done in the right way, where universities are working alongside these groups rather than directing their programs at the groups, or even worse, using them as unwilling participants. How many of you in the room are aware that when you put green infrastructure into cities, you tend to gentrify neighborhoods? Have you heard that before? You know, so a lot of times when we think about mitigating climate change, we're looking how do we solve an environmental problem without looking at the underlying social problems we may create in turn. Now when I say, you know, we should be working with the urban community, who exactly do I mean? And how do we go about doing that? Well, I really do mean everybody that your university or your urban policy office serves you know, within an urban area. And outreach needs to be extensive so that we're being inclusive and that we're engaging with the full diversity of the urban residents that we serve. Now, it can be difficult sometimes for institutions to make those community partnerships. So you know, our suggestion always is find the community organizations that are already prevalent and already doing good work and can help you make inroads. That could be black churches, for example. It could be urban Hispanic farmer groups. It could be community and economic development organizations. Whoever is active in your geographic area. The other thing that I would recommend too in terms of collaborations are to find groups that are already doing the work that you wanna provide your expertise for and partner on their initiatives in support don't try to take over initiatives or to lead. Now, I want to talk briefly about UDC, you know, since we are an HBCU, oftentimes primarily white institutions come to us to, to partner with the community. One caveat I want to throw in there is when you're working with minority serving institutions, you also need to understand what our realities are like and the support that we need in order to partner with you and to engage the community. So my center at UDC, the Center for Urban Research, Engagement, and Scholarship was formed 18 months ago. So we're a relatively new cross-campus multidisciplinary center. And our purpose is to drive research and innovation so that we're in increasing equitability, sustainability, resilience within cities. And so the model that we're taking is to partner with community stakeholders at every step of the process. We start by reaching out to the community to see what they know and what they prioritize in terms of the climate crisis and other environmental degradation and for increasing resilience within their neighborhoods. So once we know what their priorities are, what their knowledge is, then we act as facilitators to pull together our campus experts, other external experts, the community stakeholders, and our students to design and implement research and innovation. So one example I wanna give before I end is, you know, recently we received through the Department of Energy, the Minority Serving Institutions Partnership Program, a, a scholarship, a grant to support our students and also work with federal partners and with other uh, district agencies. And the purpose of that program is to increase the number of BIPOC individuals entering STEM careers. It's to work directly with the BIPOC community here in DC to mitigate and adapt to, to the climate crisis. It's to increase bi-directional exchange of information between the community and institutions. It's to infuse our curricula, 
our academic as well as our extension curricula with climate change information so that we're increasing the well-informed workforce you know, that's entering into these types of careers. And it's to create entrepreneurs. So that's just one example. You know, we call this program Climate Core, and the core part stands for community outreach, research, and education. So I mentioned earlier how we really integrate all of those areas at UDC, and I think this can serve as a good model. I'd be happy to talk about this more later if there's time or tomorrow when you visit us on campus. Thanks very much. Matthew. Bob, we're down to five minutes in the panel. I'm sorry. You've written extensively about global climate change. You've also talked about the history, 150-year history of our land-grant universities, and you think we can do a better job of linking education, research, and practice to serve as catalyst of community climate action. Tell us what you're thinking. Sure. Uh, happy to wrap up this panel. Um, I was just sitting here looking at who's sitting with me and realizing, although it wasn't planned for the people on this panel are from land-grant institutions, and I don't think that's Though it's not planned, I don't think it's a coincidence because I think the history of land grants have really primed our institutions to be prepared to serve in this role as catalysts of community climate action. Um, so let's talk about the land grant model. Right? The land grant model came together of the half century between 1862 and 1914, resting on three pillars. So one, pillar one is accessible public higher education provided by colleges of agriculture and engineering that were established by the Morrill Acts in every state and territory. The second is fundamental and applied agriculture-related research conducted and disseminated through a network of state agricultural experiment stations. And the third, importantly, is cooperative extension, a, a federal, state, county, university partnership that has placed agents in almost every county in the country with the mission of what the 1914 Smith-Lever Act calls diffuse, the diffusion and application of useful and practical information related to agriculture and home economics. These pillars parallel the tripartite mission of instruction, research, and service that I think almost every university would say it shares. Um, but a distinctive aspect of the land-grant model is the recognition, um, as noted in a 1930 report, that a core part of that service mission is to bring people together for social interaction, to study, to solve community problems, and to foster better relations towards a common endeavor. And in that context, looking at Laura's remark of adding an inequality crisis to our climate crisis, I'm going to take that and add a democracy crisis to that stack and say, well, this sort of bringing people together um, to solve problems and towards a common endeavor is part of a solution to that. Now, higher education institutions in general are particularly well suited to the sort of convening role that Extension has led in because we are inherently networked, scale spanning institutions. We have deep roots in our local communities, while we're also connected to a global network of peer institutions and of researchers. And we work to understand and solve the problems of the world today, while also training people who will work to solve the world's problem for the next half century. And this model of bringing people together in our communities, linked to global knowledge networks with one eye on the present and one on the next generation, is exactly what's needed to support communities, government, and the private sector in meeting the challenges of the climate crisis. So you've heard from some of my panelists about how our institutions are moving this direction. We've been doing this at Rutgers too, drawing upon both cooperative extension and the broader university. Um, for example, over the last decade, we have convened an alliance of governments, communities, and businesses to understand and search for solutions to the state's climate challenges. We've helped deploy nature-based solutions for coastal resilience. More recently, with state support and, and drawing, among other things, on the, on the model of the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, we set up the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center, uh, which is hosted at Rutgers, but by state law, leverages the expertise of the entire higher ed sector of the state to tackle challenges like developing climate smart municipal plans, more equitable state buyout strategies, and uh, coordinating some of the, uh, New Jersey's involvement in multi-state uh, transport sector climate initiatives. The genius of the land grant model is that it recognizes that convening people to understand and solve problems is both a core university mission and a skilled activity that requires human capacity. It cannot be done by moonlighting research and teaching faculty alone. Right? You need a faculty of extension specialists and agents for whom convening people to link societal needs to university research and education is a primary job, and frankly, often more than a full-time job. And that 
frankly, I think is a missing link in realizing higher ed's full potential has a catalyst of societal climate action. Yes, we've talked about how quite a few universities now have a few climate translators who develop trusted relations with partners and help bring people together to connect societal needs and university expertise. But what's missing is both scale and stability. The number of climate translators does not meet the demand. And the relationships that take many years to build can easily disappear when you're funding those people on short-term project funding or even if a critical person decides to retire. This, as we heard earlier, is a critical decade, but climate change is a decades and even centuries long problem. And relying centrally on a handful of people who are sometimes paid month to month is not a resilient solution for catalyzing climate action. And that's fragility that creates costly inefficiency. Contrast that with the land-grant model, which provides capacity funding for extension and use-inspired research, allowing faculty to develop decades-long relationships of trust. Because that funding is there, land-grant universities align their incentive structures to support research that directly helps solve real-world problems. I believe, and I, I've written about, as Todd mentioned, that a land-grant style and land-grant scale of investment in climate extension, what could really unlock the role of higher ed has a catalyst of societal climate action, not just for regions that right now are well endowed with both expertise and wealth, but like the land grant system itself, it's something that's accessible for every community. Thanks very much, Bob. I just want to end this uh, panel. One of our original panel, uh, panelists, Erica Bailey Johnson from Bemidji State, had a family emergency. Our thoughts are with her. Um, but Erica <clears throat> is also a member of the Ojibwe tribe. And she would like to remind us um, of our responsibility to Mother Earth. We must remember to show gratitude and respect for all the Earth has given us <clears throat> and realize that we are a part of this community of life. We have a responsibility to ourselves and the rest of the planet upon which we depend. We must continue to believe in <clears throat> and work towards a future that we can't really see yet in this global village, a future that focuses on healing instead of consuming a future that values differences, <clears throat> a future that shows reciprocity, a future that can plan towards wellness for all rather than profit for few. We all deserve to feel connected, protected, and respected, including Mother Earth. Thanks. Thank you so much, Todd, and your entire panel. Um, I'd now like to invite our final panel up to the table. This group of institutions will be highlighting some of the solutions that they are developing, demonstrating, and teaching on their own campuses today. This session will be moderated by Matt St. Clair, Chief Sustainability Officer for the University of California System. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you to everyone who organized uh, this great forum today. I am Matt St. Clair. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for the University of California System. And I will serve as, as the moderator for this panel on campuses as a proving ground for sustainability, climate, and energy solutions. So as we've heard already today, campuses across all 50 states are engaged in developing and implementing climate solutions. Every region in the country also has different opportunities and challenges for decarbonizing their campuses and increasing resilience in the face of a, of a changing climate. In essence, each campus provides a proving ground for regionally appropriate community scale climate solutions. As a proving ground, campuses must answer questions about what are the best options for reducing emissions and increasing campus resilience? What will it cost? what incentives are available to help reduce costs, and how can it be financed? Are there new and innovative climate solutions being developed by faculty and students that could be tested and deployed on campus? Can campus climate actions provide training and educational opportunities for our students? How can campuses model climate solutions for all, an imperative we've heard repeatedly already today, and connecting all of these above, how should we be operating our campuses so that we practice what we teach f about climate impacts and climate solutions? So to hear more about these efforts, we have representatives from five colleges and universities across the country 
to share their experiences and talk about how they would help accelerate climate action at their own institutions and surrounding communities. So we have with us today, President Chris Caldwell from the College of Menominee Nation, Peter Dorhout from the Vice President of Research at Iowa State, Jennifer Haverkamp, the Director of the Graham Inst Sustainability Institute at the University of Michigan, Randy Thomas, Vice President at Miami University, and Julie Newman, Director of Sustainability at MIT. Let's start by a quick round of introductions from you, sharing a brief description of how you view campus sustainability. And we'll start with President Caldwell. Thank you. Poso Mauni Wea, Chris Caldwell, Nawiswan, Nato Tamawasa, Way, Omatnamane, Nawaitim. So my name is Chris Caldwell. My clan is the Bear. Um, I am a Menominee tribal member. I grew up there. I work there. I serve our institution. And um, prior to being president, I actually worked in our forest and I led our Sustainable Development Institute where we focused on um, the concept of sustainability from an indigenous sustainability perspective. And, and that's a way to recognize as indigenous peoples, we've always worked to sustain our communities. Um, we know our responsibilities to our human and non-human relatives and the environment that we are a part of. And so a, a big part of that as well is, is our language and our culture because they teach us lessons of how we take care of those responsibilities and relationships. Um, a, a way to say that in our language, Natanawe Makanuk means all my relations and it it covers the nuances, the complexities, and the uncertainties that come with a, a Western-based phrase like sustainability. And so um, that's how we approach it at, at the College of Menominee Nation. And if we do it that way, everything else just follows from there. So it's, it's a really um, community-based understanding. So. Thank you, President Caldwell. Uh, Jennifer Haverkamp. Thank you. Um, I'm the director of the Graham Sustainability Institute at the University of Michigan, where I also teach at the law school. Um, Mary Frances uh, pretty much uh, introduced the University of Michigan to you all earlier and uh, appreciate her shout out that she gave us. Um, before I came to the University of Michigan, I uh, spent my career basically here in Washington working at EPA, the Justice Department, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, and then had the honor of leading some of the climate negotiations um, at the State Department. Uh, as soon as I came to Michigan four years ago, the President announced that he was committing the university to a pathway to carbon neutrality, and I ended up co-chairing a commission to figure out how we would get there and by when. And I think that that experience with that carbon neutrality commission informed my view of campus sustainability because our charge was very clearly that we had to come up with solutions that were scalable and transferable. And I think that is the definition of campus sustainability. Why do it just for your own campus? It's our responsibility, especially given the intensity of the climate crisis, to take our solutions outside of the ivory tower. We can't keep them locked up there for our own use. The other thing I think about uh, defining carbon neutrality, defining campus sustainability is that it is a process. It isn't something you achieve at some point. Every wave of students who comes through has to be brought into that new culture and to see it and feel it and believe it and graduate wanting to do something about it. And so there's a role for every member of the campus community in addressing sustainability. It's the faculty, it's the staff, it's the students. We have to do it together. And um, I would just say it's an ongoing process. It's also very much about culture change. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll go to Peter next. Good afternoon, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, 
Robert already introduced us all to the land grant university, and so I will rewrite my entire introduction <laughs> because of that. I'm, I'm a chemistry professor, and I'm the vice president for research uh, at Iowa State, and I'm privileged to be the leader of the research enterprise at the university, which is, uh, has been recognized by AASHE with, with a, uh, a gold and a top 10 sustainable uh, impact campus for both its engagement as well as diversity and affordability. We partner with our students and external stakeholders at, at all of our facilities across campus. But in particular, and you asked us to think about this in our introduction, uh, the uh, uh, ec facilities like the Biocentury Research Farm at, at Iowa State and, and the Biorenewables Research Laboratory that's home to the Bioeconomy Institute and our ADM uh, Biorenewables Education Laboratory. We share part of our campus with the, the USDA ARS National Lab for Agriculture and the Environment, which is part of the Midwest Climate Hub, which we, we heard about earlier. For us, innovation and sustainability is really embedded in our student experiences as we strive uh, to be the trusted partner for providing proactive solutions to global challenges. As a land-grant university, sustainability is coded into our DNA. A commitment to sustainable families, communities, and businesses, as well as uh, all, all being part of our education and research and engagement missions um, through our cooperative extension offices. DNA is, of course, most valuable when it's used to propagate the next generations of sustainability innovations and innovators and implementors. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We'll go to Randy next. Aya from Miami University. We are located 45 minutes from Cincinnati, Ohio, 45 minutes from Dayton, Ohio, and about 10 minutes from the Indiana border. We are out in the middle of cornfields. Uh, we educate students from all 50 states, from international countries, and all around. So we have various stakeholders. Um, but what all of our stakeholders agree on as a public institution is, is that we're committed to being good stewards of the public trust. And that doesn't just start with finances. It also, start, it also goes on to sustainability. So we look to maximize efficiency of our energy consumption. We look to max, excuse me, maximize our productivity of our energy delivery systems. And we hope in doing that that we maximize the return on investment in all the ways that reduce our carbon footprint and hopefully do our little part to leave adequate resources for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. And now Julie. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Matt, and so good to be with all of you today. Um, before I answer a question, I just want to have a moment to say I've been in many meetings for the past two decades, and this is incredible to see who's in the room using the same language, you know, after almost two decades together. It's, it's a really truly, so this is an all-in moment. I think that's why the OSTP called us all here. It's an all-in moment. And I would say we've succeeded at scaling in 1.0. Maybe we have our 1.0 version. We can say we've done that. I mean, we've got a person here from every single state, or almost, I believe, you know, across so many different institutions. Sorry, Matt, I'm going off, off topic here. But I just want to take that moment so that when we gather tomorrow, we, we take this momentum. And maybe the charge is what's the 3.0 version of scaling, or whatever that, that level is, because we're not starting from scratch. So with that said, as I, as I scan the room, I see many of you whom I've known for many years. We've, many of us have been in the field. It sounds like those of you I'm just meeting, 15, 20, 25 years, uh, where's my energy friend there? Maybe more, it sounds like, from the energy department. I mean, this is truly, and friends who are online, I mean, it's a tremendous opportunity to bring to bear the knowledge between us that we've heard about in the first two panels to determine how to scale the campus sustainability models we've created and built over the past two plus decades, and more importantly, to plan for the future and the essential and complex, and as we're all saying here, really unique role higher education can play and must play in, in combating and preparing for a changing climate. We've got implications for research, teaching, and operations coming out of this, this next two days. 
Um, and then to finally answer Matt's question, uh, the approach that frames our commitment and the commitment uh, at MIT, but the commitment I've brought to the field um, is really, it's one for me that seeks to leverage the campus as a test bed to design, to test, to scale, and to accelerate climate and sustainability solutions. Um, but as we heard today, from technical to social, this is not a technical response only. It can't be. This is, again, an all-in moment. We have to span across the, the scale of the individual, the campus, the city, the state, the nation, and the globe. And I'll return to these points uh, if I have a chance later. It's my favorite topic. And most importantly, we have to recognize that we cannot solve for sustainability within the campuses alone. We are not islands. We're completely integrated and completely reliant upon local, state, regional, global systems from supply chain, which we learned about the past number of years, you know, to, to policy. So we have to have integrated systems-based responses. The institutions of higher education committed to sustainability and get ready, we must be willing to take organizational transformations that are going to be necessary to respond to this changing climate and to really achieve what we're, what we're talking about today. These are brand new models that we have to create. And it's going to take the types of all of us together, you know, sitting at this table. It's, it's the different perspectives that we're sitting together today to learn each other languages to really think about transformation. Um, and so just to, in conclusion on this part, our campuses ought to strive and be enabled to become models of sustainability and transformed organizations. Not iteratively transformed, but transformed organizations. We have to be exemplars to, to respond to everything we heard about from the first two panels. We have to be generators of climate and sustainability, innovations, test beds, and the research. Again, so much of that we heard about in the first two panels, it's taking place. But how do we scale that up? Um, and then, of course, our unique role are educational innovators, and we've heard that in the workforce panel as well. You know, how do we uh, innovatively educate this next generation, which it sounds like there's so many experts uh, t in, the, in the room today to respond to that. So in conclusion, we have existing strategies. We do know how to scale, but now we have to get to this next 3.0 level, if you will, to enable and build the capacity to undertake these transformations and to create common language across the different positions sitting here and sitting across the other panels. So thank you, Matt. Thank you, Julie, and, and all of you for laying out a vision of the role of campus sustainability in this space. And now let's move to hear some concrete examples of what that means in practice on your campus. How are you using your campuses to be living laboratories for sustainability solutions? And show us how that activates all parts of the university's mission. So we'll start with you, Julie. Can you explain more about this concept of a living laboratory at MIT and provide a concrete example of how you implement that concept on your campus? I get so excited about this, it's actually hard to just sit and talk about this, but I promise I will. I mean, for starters, I mean, the mission of the office that I run is to transform MIT into a model that generates just, equitable, applicable, and scalable solutions for responding to the unprecedented challenges of a changing climate. But that is the model I'm bringing, but that, in my mind, is it a model that should be applicable to all campuses. So, so remove the MIT piece of it. I'm supposed to tell you what I'm doing, but it's really about models that can generate, again, just, equitable, applicable, scalable solutions across all of our campuses. And underlying all of our work is this methodology of collaboration we heard a lot about today between research and operations and administration and a commitment to robust data, data collection, analysis, and it, an iterative process. It's okay to fail and it's okay to then try again and keep going. Um, every project that we engage with at, at MIT under my, um, within my group, it has to have an academic and an operational partner to proceed. And the end result, a platform which leverages the campus as a test bed in the end. This is not unique to MIT. Many universities have embraced this. We heard so many, I was taking notes on all of the incredible examples, you know, today to follow up. And we've, we're beginning to truly embrace our ability to be a scalable laboratory, to devise, pilot, implement, and evaluate these best climate mitigation resiliency practices of today. Um, and I think that's what OSTP is asking. How can we do this more? What, what unique role can we play um, in the way we're doing today? But I think, I think the OSTP is challenging us to offer that up in even a different way than so far. 
The example that I was, I, right, Matt, I gotta have one example. The example that I'll share with you is uh, one that I can't wait to connect with the NOAA person on. Uh, my office, uh, the MIT Center for Global Change uh, Science, and my office, the Office of Sustainability, uh, back in 2015, we partnered for, to collaboratively address the risks of a changing climate and its anticipated impacts on the campus and community. And the impact, just as we heard today, you know, uh, more frequent flooding, uh, extreme precipitation, rising sea levels, uh, you know, heat events, and, uh, and understanding can we create a model that can be, you know, again, scaled up and understand implications <coughs> from campuses to marginalized communities. So we launched this, uh, we launched this collaboration to um, use the campus as the model. We analyzed potential impacts for disruption. That's another topic we should probably get to is how do campuses, note to OSTP, how do we prepare for disruption from climate? Uh, but to disruption in our area, to critical research, to education, community, infrastructure, and the campus operations. Um, in our case, the lead PI, uh, a wonderful colleague by the name of Dr. Ken Strisbeck, uh, led the research and he was preparing a preliminary campus flood risk model pro to project flood depths in a future changing climate. But the key here is um, I'd seen his group speak about a climate model they were using uh, globally. And that we said, why don't you downscale that to Cambridge and, and apply it to 2030-2070 demodeling. And within, and again, this is the part that I think where acceleration comes in. It still took us another two years to get all the data that you needed, you know, from below grade infrastructure to map to that, to map to that model. We harmonized the campus flood risk model in partnership with the city of Cambridge and in turn produced one shared, fliss, shared flood risk model that crossed campus city boundaries. So, um, in conclusion, we are able to have a harmonized model to now inform MIT building projects, uh, um, uh, planning and so on, to, uh, to working closely with the city on flood mitigation, flood preparedness. We're doing a porosity study to look at uh, below grade areas of research uh, and looking at flood preparedness. And so it's an ongoing effort used by both campus and the city teams for aligning common understanding of our areas. As somebody said, we can't, uh, we don't have borders around our campuses. We have to solve for this across systems. And in short, um, this is just how we can be exemplars to each other. It, it's the model that embodies the intersection of research, education, operations, community partnerships, um, and uh, maybe just for future discussions on, on my radar and in, in what I'm starting to work on next is how do you conceptualize a, a decarbonization campus lab as well, in our case to advance a commitment to zero direct emissions by 2050. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, thanks Matt. Thank you Julie for giving us that conceptual model and a great uh, concrete example of that. Let's hear from some additional Examples focus on making campuses more resilient to a changing climate and changing energy demands. Randy, your campus was a pioneer in converting to geothermal heating. Can you tell us more about these efforts, what motivated you to do this, and how it has worked out? Uh, thank you, Matt. First, first, I want to thank the White House uh, Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, Dr. Benson, uh, the National Science Foundation, you know, for, for bringing us all together for this workshop. Um, I can tell you from Miami's perspective, we know this concept will work because it worked for us in our geothermal. So when we started down the path of geothermal, uh, our neighbors to the west, Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, had uh, installed geothermal. And they were willing to share with us the things that went well and quite candidly some of the things that didn't go so well. So as we went down the path of installing geothermal, we had that expertise, so we're we're big proponents of this concept because uh, we've we've uh, already um, been beneficiaries of it. As I said, we're from a, a, a rural community, and um, I said a little bit about our stakeholders. All of our stakeholders are sophisticated. Um, some of them may not be as sophisticated in sustainability as those of you in this room, and so they ask questions like, "Well, why are you doing this? What is this for? And what's?" at the end of the day, the payoff. So I'm just gonna share with you some of the numbers that we have been able to uh, achieve. Um, uh, most of it through geothermal, about 40% of the buildings on our campus um, by uh, 2026 will all be geothermal. But we also have, hot, uh, excuse me, um, hot water heating 
as well as simultaneous cooling and heating. And our purchase of energy also all goes into um, our master plan that we put together in 2008, was approved by our board um, uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, but since over a 10-year period, we've uh, managed to save $68, min $68 million in um, energy savings. Uh, in 2008, for example, we spent 1.25 uh, per uh, GSF on energy, and that number in 2019 was down to 81 cents. Uh, during that time frame as well, we experienced a 22% increase in our gross square footage. So I'll repeat that again. Our gross square footage grew, and our total gross square footage of expenditure on um, carbon fuels and other things dropped, right? And so 48 million of that was reduction in energy consumption, and 27 million was a reduction in energy cost. Um, we expect by, as I said, 2026, that our um, uh, GSF uh, spending will be down to 69 cents. So we're really excited. We have um, three geothermal projects that we've installed. Uh, the one that I'm proudest of, I, I, I don't know about others on our campus, is uh, we have uh, two residence halls that were built. I think one was 1829 and one was 1832. They're old. <laughs> They're old. Uh, we, we're still trying to figure out whether they're the oldest in the country or not. I'm sure one of you all will have an institution to say, oh, we've got one older. But the point is they're old. And we did not have to tear them down. We did not have to retrofit them. But by using geothermal, they were the, the um, oldest facilities on campus with the most modern heating and cooling on campus. Okay. So then when that worked, people were like, hey, let's try this someplace else on campus. So we went to our western campus uh, and, and provided it there. Um, I think it was uh, roughly 700 wells, 600 feet. Uh, deep, each well's uh, contained system. You all know how geothermal works. I won't insult your intelligence. Uh, and our next one will be uh, 1,200 wells um, uh, that will then um, tap off uh, our geothermal. Uh, when we're done, we will have only two buildings that will be left that um, aren't on uh, one of those three um, areas that I spoke of, and we're trying to figure out how that's done. So that, that's an example of, of, of what we've done uh, in geothermal and other things. Um, Cody Powell, our director of physical facilities, tells me I always have to say we didn't accomplish that all with geothermal. It was, it was a combination of things. So I want to make sure that, uh, that I get that out there. That's for you, Cody. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. It's, it's a great example and I think important to understand even while new investments are required that this can save money, especially if you start with energy efficiency across the University of California system, through our partnerships with investor-owned utilities, we've implemented over 1,000 energy efficiency projects over the last 15 years, generated $100 million in incentives coming into the campuses, wow. and we save over $30 million a year in utility costs that then can go back into the exactly. mission. So it's important to make that economic case first. So Jennifer, uh, the University of Michigan, as we've already heard, has set some ambitious carbon neutrality goals like you see and many other universities in this room have. Can you tell us more about your campus sustainability programs and what you've learned from them? Sure, happy to. And um, I want to build a little bit on some of what Julie said about being transformational as universities. Just, just yesterday, uh, we inaugurated the 15th president of the University of Michigan, Santa Ono. And in his speech, he said that his vision was to be the leader of Michigan through a transformative phase, that universities sometimes change gradually over time, and sometimes there have to be big pivots. And one of his top two or three priorities is climate change. And so we expect to be doing even more and more in this space. And as far as the living lab concept of trying to bridge that divide between operational and the academic and research side, um, we are not as far along yet as MIT, but we will be posting soon a position for an associate vice president for campus sustainability to lead on the operations side, and we'll be developing a structure on the academic side to coordinate and elevate our work on education and research and engagement, but then also to work with that associate vice president on the areas that really intersect living learning labs, and campus culture, which really is so much of both. 
um, speaking about campus culture, it's important to have uh, demonstrable examples of how you're going toward greater sustainability and uh, greenhouse gas reduction. And to that end, one of our goals, which is to have all of our purchased electricity carbon neutral by 2025, we have half of that already through a purchase through the big utility, and we've recently announced another RFP to get there. But then also for um, solar on campus, we have put out an RFP for 25 megawatts of solar right on campus, around campus, in the nearby area. And we did that in partnership with the city of Ann Arbor, who put out their RFP at the same time for their own purchase. So I think that collaboration is also important. One of the things that we've learned is that financial incentives uh, can be effective. And so to help our schools and colleges become more energy efficient, we've created a revolving energy fund and put 25 million into that. And so each school and college, if they come up with energy efficiency projects, um, those are funded out of that fund and then their cost reductions go back in to replenish it um, over time. And um, then the other important thing to do is to make sure that you are encouraging these creative, smart students that we all have to go forward with their own ideas. One example that I think is fun is in our medical system. We have a medical system, our medical school and the hospital are half of our greenhouse gas emissions for the Ann Arbor campus. Um, the students have created something called White Coats for Planetary Health and that's a project where they're developing curricular material for every organ system um, across the body to bring in environmental health into that. Um, then I guess the last thing I would say about us is we are near Detroit. Um, that is the birthplace of the automobile, which has produced an awful lot of greenhouse gas emissions, as well as a lot of great things over time. And we have a, a variety of initiatives where we're trying to really build on the expertise that we have to move toward um, much more sustainable transportation, including especially electric vehicles. Um, we, uh, with uh, significant funding, $130 million, the state of Michigan has um, asked us to host an electric vehicle center for transformation, for training, for education, for finding ways to elevate and accelerate that transformation. Um, and we also have something called M-City, which is, it's been around for about 10 years, but it's really a, a lab where university researchers, 25 different companies, uh, government funds all come together to um, develop more sustainable and safe uh, mobility. And one of the things back on the equity question that I think is perhaps relevant here is the next phase of M-City is bringing a whole digital, um, digital access to that uh, series of demonstration projects and experiments. And so academics from any institution around the country can bring their, bring their pro experiments and proposals to it. So you don't have to be the University of Michigan to be part of that. Thank you, Jennifer. That's all exciting to hear. And I think we're going to shift now into talking about the innovation and climate solutions education pro programs um, that some of you have implemented. So President Caldwell, uh, you already mentioned that you previously ran the Sustainable Development Institute on your campus. Can you talk to us about the goals of that institute, how it ties into campus sustainability, and how it's increasing awareness and education about sustainable development opportunities for students and the community. Sure, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, just to give a bit more context, we are a, a land grant institution. Uh, there are 35 tribal colleges and universities in the nation which are all land grant institutions. They're known as the 1994s. The College of Menominee Nation we just celebrated our 30th anniversary last week, so uh, 30 years since we first opened our doors as a way to provide higher education opportunities for our people based on our worldview, coupled with Western-based understandings uh, to create 
students that were ready to operate in a multicultural world. Um, and it's not just open to Menominee students, but any indigenous or anyone that wants to come learn with and from us. So this, this approach as an institution, we focus on uh, the, the perpetuation, the uh, research promotion for language and scholarship because language is an important part of our tribal communities. Um, so as a, as a land grant institution, we also operate through research, education, and outreach models as described previously. And a lot of that work has been done through our Sustainable Development Institute, which was created about the same time the college was. And so the, the institute itself is 30 years old, housed under the umbrella of the college. And it has a twofold mission. Uh, the first part is to reflect upon the Menominee experience and relationship with our forest, and then to disseminate what we learn to expand upon our understandings of sustainability and other areas of community life. And so that, that's been a, a big part of the Institute. I was actually an intern in the Institute when I first started back to school eventually came back to serve as director. I thought that was full circle, but then I was asked to step in as president, so I'm assuming that's full circle, but <laughs> you never know. Uh, but I, I think that's the, the, the strength of the institute, the college, and tribal colleges in general, their connection and being rooted directly in the tribal communities they serve. Um, Although we are only 30 years old, we work from a knowledge system that's thousands of years old, place-based knowledge system. And so that's really what SDI expands on, on the campus, but connected with our communities that we serve and work with, and even at the regional, national, international level with other indigenous peoples and organizations. A lot of that work is guided through our theoretical model of sustainability, which is which is the um, sum, summation of our experiences with the forest. And through that model, we, we investigate environmental issues that impact human environmental relationships. Climate change has been the biggest one that's come along since the Institute started. And so in 2010, our Institute really focused on understanding what that meant specifically, well, ecologically, environmentally, socially, but more specifically what it meant for us as an indigenous peoples in our relationship with our land and our, our forest. And so SDI, as a part of the college with our faculty, students, and our partners, we looked at different things like organizing a sustainability committee to look at our campus, our greenhouse gas, um, output and then how do we reduce our, our carbon footprint so they do that through recommendations but even more importantly is our community-based research agenda which looks at what does the community want to know more about and so one of our biggest projects that we had worked on was the measuring the pulse of the forest where it included a coupled um, social and ecological project that looked at an assessment of our forest cultural relationships, brought in climate modeling to see what relationships would be most impacted, and then worked with the community to develop adaptive solutions for that. And by doing that, we also share out our work with other tribal communities. Um, a big part of that has come through our tribal adaptation menu work with a number of other tribal organizations. Um, that one's widely available, particularly um, out of, with support from the, the U.S. Forest Service's um, NIACS, Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. So that, that one helps to guide how to integrate indigenous and traditional knowledges into um, climate adaptation planning processes. So those are just a, a few quick projects that we work on. But we do that by managing um, our relationships with our communities and other organizations like the Climate Adaptation Science Centers, like um, my good friend Anne-Marie Chischilly's um, ITEP uh, Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, 
uh, Kyle White from University of Michigan. So, so we know how to be diplomatic in our work, and I think that's the strength of our institute that we carry into this climate um, work and serving as a living lab. Thank you, President Caldwell. I love those examples. We'll turn again uh, on innovation that, uh, Peter, you already touched on. Uh, at the beginning, you're working closely at Iowa State with the agricultural sector to develop and test sustainable and regenerative biomass feedstocks for low carbon energy supplies and negative emissions. Can you tell us some more about those efforts and how uh, you use your campus as a living laboratory? Yeah, thank you. And um, so I'm going I'm to channel Dr. Rios and, and President Caldwell again. In, in, you can't have agriculture without culture. And um, agriculture and this sector, large, small, urban, um, and, and rural, are called upon to provide the solutions for feeding 10 billion people in the world by 2050. That's the, that's the other challenge that we're, we're grappling with when we think about the, the climate and addressing climate change and, and just coming up with, with solutions to, uh, to manage in this space. So I already mentioned the BioCentury uh, Research Farm, which is a development and demonstration campus for students and faculty to to innovate around digital and precision agriculture and bio-based products and food processing and safety. And I'll, I just want to pick on one of those threads. It's this facility, for example, uh, provides some high bay uh, research space that enables us to do some scale-up projects like, uh, like what's happening with the Bioeconomy Institute or BEI biochar project. Now, my colleague, Professor Lisa Schulte Moore, is, is uh, the co-director of the BEI. She's in the audience, so she will offer an informed rebuttal uh, when I'm done here. <laughs> but the, the BEI team is, is, has developed some new greener pyrolysis processes to, that will produce char or carbon from corn stover, the byproduct that's left to typically compost on the fields after harvest. It's also... Um, unfortunately, a, a source of greenhouse gases in that, um, uh, in that state. Now, the new pyrolysis process and it, uh, really eliminates the need for external energy sources to achieve anaerobic reduction of biomass. This is essentially reducing the material to carbon, and I, I explained early on I'm a chemist, so I'm sorry about that. But, um, and, and it also then can add some value because... It, it reduces material to carbon as well as bio oil products that are that are part of the uh, the output. This demonstration project um, received a, an X Prize milestone award. It's enabling a production scale facility to be built inside an old brick manufacturing factory that was slated for for demolition in a community nearby. Um, now, with corporate partners, and I'm going to invoke the corporate partners requirement here, but with corporate partners and community partners, the BEI team scaled up the works, which now has the capacity to produce 3,500 tons of biochar per year, 5,000 tons of bio oil per year, removing an equivalent of 4,500 tons of CO2. Um, this is essentially a modular and modern and manageable model that can be exported to, um, to, to other communities. The BEI is also home to the Consortium for Cultivating Human and Naturally Regenerative Enterprises, or Sea Change, and its portfolio of projects with community stakeholders and includes a program called Prairie Strips. It's using prairie grasses and perennials um, that can be interspersed with crops and crop production to reduce soil erosion, to reduce soil loss or nutrient loss, and improve yields uh, for for the producers. So uh, we're, I recognize that we're we're running a little bit short on time. So I'm going to jump right to the end. Uh, I think these are these are really examples of what could be called a circular bioeconomy model um, that can work on the local scale. It works on our campus as a demonstration model, engages our students in the learning and, and workforce development process, but ultimately 
can save farm families and farm businesses money, engaging them in the proactive and environmental management practices where they can make a difference. And this is not just for our students, but for our farm families as well. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's some amazing work. We're about out of time. Uh, we have time for one line, one sentence from each of you on how to scale this up with government partnerships, if any of you want to take on that challenge. And then we've got to wrap up. How do we scale? Just from our experiences with the Climate Adaptation Science Center, I think that's been what's been most effective. But from the tribal perspective is that having access to equitable amounts of funding, no matter what the partnership, and then the flexibility to design projects that are culturally appropriate and meet the needs of the tribal community. So them being the designers of the project, I think has been the most effective um, partnership between our tribal college and, and government agency. I, I, I will, um take the lead of the gentleman from Department of Transportation and, or Department of Energy and answer the question I wish you would have asked, and that is why should we do this? Uh, we recently had a convocation, you all know what convocation is, 4,000 students, you know, there for less than a week, they're in our big Millette Hall, we've got our band there and our cheerleaders and the academicians are there and we're telling them about all the wonderful things at Miami University and all the things you can do. And President Crawford gets to what we're doing on sustainability and we get a standing ovation. So we need to figure out <laughs> how to incentivize folks to be able to work together. In our little neck of the woods, much like you said, uh, with Ann Arbor, we're looking at solar to get that last little bit so, we're off the, so that we are um, off uh, fossil fuels and, and are at zero emissions. Um, we're looking at whether, whether that's solar or what that is. The city of Oxford is looking at solar. Right now, we can't find a way for us to collaborate together, although we want to, where we would be incentivized. And so I plan to meet with the person from uh, the Department of Energy, because he said they have a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, we'd like to tap into some of those funds. Um, but we've got Butler County. Transportation is a rural uh, uh, institution. Um, we have people coming and going, so we partner with our Butler County Regional Transit Authority. We also partner with CVG International Airport, the experts in that. And so I think that in addition to higher ed, there are other partners out there, as, as everyone has mentioned, that if we could be incentivized and um, uh, find ways to work together, that would be wonderful. So thank you, Matt. I think one role that we could play to help with scaling up is something that you heard a lot about when people were talking about the land grants and extension, which is for universities to help bridge that gap between the federal funding and the local communities. Be, take it beyond the ag sector. Um, so maybe it's passed through to state government, but it's really using our students, using our faculty, um, using our communities to get out and work with the communities on what they need to have done. Um, we have a program that we're doing with the state of Michigan that reaches out to the several cities in the state of Michigan who want help with meeting their climate goals. Then the last thing I would just say is all of us have alumni and we deal with our alumni a lot. We actually have 600,000 alumni, but um, that is a community to bring into this, this conversation. You know, when think of them as partners, not just as donors, but think of them as partners in disseminating your climate solutions. Since I'm one of your alum, thank you. Yeah, um, look what look what happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess just even though I only have one, I'm going to say three points in one sentence, Matt. I'm from New Jersey, so I'm going to try to put it all in one. Um, I think we have to solve within nested scales. I think we have to be cautious about thinking about scales. Everything's large, but thinking about this, you know, uh, campus to to global. Um, in doing my homework and preparing for here, I looked at you know the DOD climate challenge budget, the NOAA climate modeling work. It's amazing. We're all using the same language now, and so there's so much baked in there, which is now parallel or relate, relatable um, to what we heard from the NSF today. So lots of opportunity there in terms of tapping into those existing programs. And then I guess just in conclusion, I think there's 
um, skipping all of my other thoughts, Matt, but just jumping to here, I mean, there's just great potential for the universities to work across the federal agencies possibly, leverage these existing structures and programs to become or act as these as exemplars and test beds to accelerate, innovate, you know, deploy, grapple with, and educate the next generation. So, so many other thoughts I hope we can share tomorrow. Yeah. Matt, thank you so much. Last word, oh. Peter. Matt, I, I grew up in New Jersey too, but I am really going to say <laughs> one word, and that's trust. Mm -hmm. We talked about trust in, in developing communities and, and, and understanding culture, cooperative extension in, in, as part of the land grant system builds trust, has trust, is the trusted voice within our communities. Trust mm -hmm. comes about through engaging folks at the beginning of the project, engaging them in developing what, what is, you're going to cr ultimately create, not after you've done it and you want to deploy it. Trust. Uh, thank you again to all of our panelists. Thank you to OSTP and NSF for bringing us together, and thank you. We're so appreciative of all of our panelists today for uh, sharing their experiences and providing a great cross-section of the work being done across the country, so thank you all. Um, we're going to make a quick transition to our closing remarks. I want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Laura Petesh, the Chief of Staff for Climate and Environment and the Assistant Director for Climate Resilience here at OSTP. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, it's so great to be here and to hear about all the inspiring work happening at campuses across the nation. It's just truly, truly inspirational. Um, having grown up in the college town of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, go Heels, I have personally experienced how campuses can serve as a lifeline for communities. In 1996, Hurricane Fran roared through our area um, downing trees in my neighborhood with spin-off tornadoes, and we were basically trapped at home uh, with no power for two weeks. Um, we, yeah, we couldn't move our vehicles, and uh, local primary schools and most businesses were closed, but we could walk to the university for power and for water. Colleges and universities are a key part of community resilience. Higher education leaders have the opportunity, as many of you are doing here, um, to take ambitious actions to cut emissions, develop innovative technologies and approaches, share science and services with communities, and enhance the resilience of their facilities, including through nature-based solutions. This leadership is key to meeting the US's climate goals. We can't do it alone with just the federal government. We need universities and colleges at the table. And many colleges and universities are leading the way in local communities and demonstrating climate solutions and what it looks like to be a climate smart community. Higher education institutions have an equally important opportunity, and we've heard some examples today, to educate and train a next generation workforce who is able to take on these challenges with the skills and knowledge that they need to implement solutions. I can't tell you how many students I've talked to who are desperate for more learning opportunities who are begging their schools to offer more interdisciplinary training focused on climate. And the careers they're interested in are unique, diverse, and impactful. One student told me this fall that he wants to combine his passions for sports and climate to move into a career greening the sports industry. Another told me they want to go back to their home community and work with them to enhance their resilience to climate change and advance environmental justice. A number of colleges and universities, including many of those represented here in the room and joining us virtually today, are taking action to expand the curriculum and training opportunities, but there's still ample opportunity to do more. And to not just focus on classroom learning when thinking about opportunities for students, but also on hands-on experiences. As an undergrad at Cornell, go Big Red, I learned a lot from the lectures I attended, but how I really got hooked was in the field experiencing rocky intertidal ecosystems and coral reefs through summer courses where I got to learn new research approaches, observe and experiment with the creatures I was studying, pose scientific questions and see with my own eyes both the beauty and the fragility of nature. My wish is that all students in this country have access to life-changing and career-shaping experiences such as those. I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't had those experiences. 
That being said, there are a number of barriers to access um, that still exist, grounded in historic inequities, that we have to address in order to educate and inspire a climate solutions workforce whose diversity reflects the beautiful diversity of this nation. Uh, at OSTP and the Obama administration, I worked with a talented team across the federal government to launch and implement a White House Climate Education and Literacy Initiative. This initiative spanned all ages from K to gray and elevated opportunities through both formal K to 12 and higher ed, as well as informal place-based education. We brought students to the White House to meet with the EPA administrator and attend an educational assembly on climate change. We lifted up outstanding college and university leaders as White House champions of change. A number of universities stepped forward to provide announcements and commitments. This was really exciting, but it left a lot of work undone. I'm so glad that we're dusting off some of those conversations and relationships. And this convening today and tomorrow provides an exciting opportunity to elevate the critical leadership role that higher education can play in tackling the climate crisis. We have an unprecedented opportunity during this administration for action. Thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, we have more funding than ever before for addressing the climate crisis. Thanks to leadership from the climate science community, including those from academia, we know more than ever before about the current and projected impacts of climate change. Thanks to new in innovations in clean energy technology, we have scalable solutions to rapidly cut emissions and we have incentives to do so as well. Thanks to the leadership of students and faculty, we're seeing more opportunities for education, training, and community engagement. And thanks to President Biden and others in this administration, we've made historic, unprecedented commitments to tackling the climate crisis. I look forward to seeing more actions that you all will take to elevate the role of higher education in climate mitigation, resilience, research, and education. Thank you for joining us in this important endeavor. Uh, I think I'm gonna introduce the next speaker. Um, so finally today we have Dr. Maya Tolstoy, the Dean of the College of the Environment at the University of Washington. Hi everyone, thank you so much. What an incredibly exciting and energizing day. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to all of you who are participating here in person. Uh, thank you to our audience online as well. Um, thank you to the National Science Foundation for their support. Uh, particularly a huge thank you to our hosts at OSTP for providing us with this forum for this rich and vital conversation today. And I also want to acknowledge how in interested and enthusiastic they have been from the start and really engaged in making sure that we have all the different parts of higher education represented here today and are also really engaged in helping us develop something long term. So I am the Maggie Walker Dean of the College of the Environment at the University of Washington and uh, we are one of the largest colleges of the environment uh, or of that type. In the, in the country and indeed the world. We cover everything from the foundational research that has to really underpin any solutions-based work to, solution, to uh, resource-based units and policy units, really engaging the human element as well, and then to uh, solutions-based units that are engaging with, directly with communities. And across the broader university at the University of Washington, we also have deep engagement in this issue, and as a major public university, deep and long-standing ties with the community and a commitment to serve the public good and a commitment to delivering impact. So we think about this deeply uh, across the university. We also have an exceptionally collaborative environment, and within the college, we are working to break down disciplinary barriers to be more than the sum of our parts. We're also doing that across the university and collaborating from the College of the Built Environment to the uh, business school to engineering to public health, recognizing that this is an all hands on deck moment as you all are recognizing here today. Um, so I, I wanted to say also that as, as has been said multiple times today, uh, having all of you in this room is not a first step. Many of us have already been working on this for decades or longer. 
but our hope is that it can represent a, a really important next step uh, in building our, our network as, as institutions. Um, and so we shouldn't forget that universities and colleges working together for the betterment of society is something that has a, a long history to it. As we saw most recently in the COVID-19 pandemic, that when we commit our collective resources toward a shared purpose, we are capable of achievements far beyond what we could accomplish alone. Every size and specialty of college and university has something important and vital to contribute to how we as a society and as a species will rise to the occasion. So today we've heard about some key elements of the climate-focused work that our institutions are already engaged in, how campuses are piloting technology and policy in innovations that can be scaled for even broader impact, how the resources and expertise of our federal partners can guide actions on many fronts, and how together our efforts in, in making a difference in our local, regional, and statewide communities uh, are, are coming together across, across the different states. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be putting our heads together to think about how those pieces fit together. And um, I want to outline some of the guiding questions that we're going to be thinking about tomorrow so that you can think about them tonight as well. Uh, first, making campuses more sustainable and resilient, including pathways to achieving net zero emissions. Second, ensuring that students have the knowledge and skills to lead in the clean industries of tomorrow and to build and maintain the green and resilient infrastructure we need. A third, providing climate services to states, municipalities, and indigenous communities. And fourth, that college and university campuses serving as a proving ground for new climate solutions and strategies to bring them into the innovation ecosystem. We also must ensure that with this work, we are consciously advancing uh, equity and justice in all that we do. So collaboration is at the very heart of academic inquiry and education. As researchers, teachers, or other members of the higher education community, we're always striving to break down barriers and to build relationships and to create and share knowledge for the benefit of all. As climate change becomes a daily reality on our planet, ensuring that our colleges and universities continue to lead the way on sustainability is more urgent than ever. So I am delighted and honored to be here with all of you. I'm really looking forward to our conversations tomorrow, and I firmly believe that together we can build something incredible. Thank you. So I would now like to draw an end to our forum, uh, but certainly not the end of our work together. Uh, I look forward to working with you over the coming months and years to scale uh, these solutions and make them a reality. So thank you all very much. <laughs>